Welcome to the No Shit Cast. I'm your host, Matt Fraser. Woo, back off the road for a change, ladies and gentlemen, at the home studio. Got two phenomenal guests on deck for you tonight, both of them fans of the Electric Universe Theory, two juggernauts from that space. Mr. Shifu Ramon Cariaga and Neil Thompson are joining me on the phone uh, tonight to do, uh, just kind of do an open conversation. We're going to talk a lot about... Uh, the Electric Universe, Electric Universe Theory, uh, you know, stuff that's kind of new-ish or uh, theories and things like that. But also, Sherfu wanted to come on and talk to us tonight because there's something near and dear to his heart that he kind of wants to put out there uh, uh, on the front of things like ancient Kentucky and, and some of this stuff. So we're going to let him talk about that. So uh, so individually, I'll welcome you to the show. Neil, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. And Sherfu, sure did I uh, did I get that right? It's about it's with the, yeah. with ancient Kentucky, yeah. right? So what's yeah, well, yeah yeah. So what's going on there, and how and well, first of all, how are you doing this evening, and uh, kind of fill us in on what's going on, and sort of what you wanted to kind of let us know about. Well, I'm doing pretty pretty well. I've stayed dry despite it's raining nonstop here, but I'm doing pretty well. I just gave my hidden Kentucky presentation last Sunday, and it was. Uh, a good event. I have been over my head for you know several months. Uh, you know, talking five years of a project. Uh, people, if they want to know what we're, we're talking about, is the hidden destinations ky dot com. And obviously, it's not done yet because the books aren't published yet. But it is getting that time. There's a lot of these different conferences around the country where people are getting older, and it's time for Gen X, Gen Y, and even millennials to to step up and take over the the mantle. Um, certainly, Neil can speak more from the EU conference side. He, he's known several people who have passed. And um, mm. it, it's timed for us to build a, our own conference, I think. And my goal is to raise money to create a museum uh, for the Ohio Valley region because the culture here, there are certain things that uh, cannot be discussed in uh, mainstream academia, and they will not show up in museums. And if if some of these uh, folks die and they donate their stuff to the museums, these things will go in drawers and they won't come back out ever, ever, ever again. Um, so we have a rare opportunity, if we can pull it together, to create something. So I want to I want to create a gallery using my photos from the Hidden Kentucky trip, the best of my photos, and try and raise money that way, and then having a conference, and uh, may, who knows, maybe one day we create our own uh, journal in which we have our own peer review system that is a little bit more um, open to different ideas, and but still adheres to a scientific rigor. I'm sure in the beginning it would just be like, hey, submit your articles, and we would just try and put something together, but it's something I definitely hope that you're both interested in. Um, I know that uh, you guys are both podcasters, and myself, I, I might go into podcasting. I currently just have a YouTube channel. But I want to spread the word and hopefully get people interested. And, and uh, my goal is to form a steering committee. Lee Pennington from Jolie Productions has uh, agreed to host uh, at the Kratz Place, uh, where, which is where we usually have the AKHA meetings, and that's in Louisville. Um, he's agreed to host the steering committee, but I told him he doesn't have to be responsible because his health, he really can't take on much more. Uh, so, because I'm already doing the website and their Facebook uh, page and their newsletter, I, I think it's pretty much up to myself and a couple of other guys who are there. We have some special projects going on. We go hike at various locations and investigate looking for things like stone forts and uh, glyph signs and things like that. And, of course, I'm always looking for more plasma glyphs. Um, <laughs> Uh, originally, I wasn't looking for plasma glyphs, but I do now. <laughs> and so we're always looking for ways to create this because, uh, especially Kentucky, like, you, you know, up in Ohio, you guys have r really an amazing um, Department of Tourism that appreciates what you've got there and will actually protect it. Down here, we don't have that. We, we have zero uh, outside of Wycliffe, and Wycliffe is only that way because it was already a tourist site and it was bought uh, and brought into the state historic sites. 
So we just don't have anything like that in Kentucky, and we really need it very badly because people still own a lot. They privately own a lot of things, and those those generations, they're dying, and a lot of their kids, they move off. They're not interested, and this stuff, it ends up in um, private museums, and, and uh, then it's just never seen again. So that's that's what's on my mind a lot, and uh, just certainly love to hear your all's thoughts. <laughs> so you just, I mean, really, the concern here is getting this stuff preserved. So that it preserved and presented. I yeah. mean, we're talking evidence of not just the Welsh Indians, but you're talking about the Chinese coming to America, um, the Vikings. There's all sorts of things that have happened, and there is a lot of evidence. And Lee, he just knows all this stuff in his head. It's amazing. There are books, but he, you know, we have a trip coming up to the Brandenburg Stone in Brandenburg, Kentucky. This is a stone again that wasn't in my book, and um, I'm excited to go on that trip because. Uh, it's something that's been declared a, a a hoax by the mainstream without any evidence of it being a hoax. There's they, they just categorically do that kind of thing because what a it's in, because it's in Colburn, and because it's in Colburn, they want to say that it's not real. But then there's a stone in Israel that has the exact same language, the same script, and that one is considered a a, uh, a relic or something. Yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's a common problem, and you know even like Kentucky's mummies. Um, I do know this Kentucky, obviously, but obviously, yeah, but, uh, there's, I can't obviously speak for the state of Ohio or Indiana, but this is something um, that the one that immediately comes, there might be mummies there. I don't know if I might interject. One that comes to mind instantly is the, uh, New England, uh, I guess they were called root cellar dwellings that are supposed to be early colonial work. But serve no purpose, uh, and, and obviously we're not for milling or anything, and they resemble uh, the exact same structures in, say, Ireland and places along those lines. Yeah, and that yeah, kind of a, work is commonly correct. is commonly discarded. Um, it's. Uh, uh, you know, we don't want. We there was. It's almost impossible to imagine that the scant few Native Americans that they found could possibly have built anything out of stone, as if they had permanent settlements or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, or if so, they were linked to earlier cultures that were, uh, you know, across the ocean. To kind of elaborate here. So what what we're really talking about is the, the uh, what we're preserving or what, what you're wanting to preserve here, Sh- Shifu, is is that these are. Uh, relics of ancient history in that were found and discovered inside the United States that point to cultures other than just the Native Americans being here a long, long time before anybody was supposed to be here, kind of thing, right? This is well, what, and, and you it, know, at some point, if you've been here a couple hundred years and you've mingled with the local uh, cultures, you are Native American. Yeah, it, sure. Yeah, just, I understand that. It's right. just not the Paleo Indians yeah. or the Mongoloid uh, and this is, Indians that came after them, uh, it is a different uh, vector, which it could be, we don't know. I mean, there's there's evidence that you have Middle Eastern uh, genes, you uh, like such as Persian. Um, is sometimes they have uh, Jewish genes. Um, sometimes you've got Peruvian genes, and uh, which would in, in turn probably imply, um, you know, Oceanic uh, genetic strains. So there's a whole lot of, of potential types of Native Americans. And Neil, this is and this is this however idea, they the... just don't want you to talk about it. But it, that's all coming apart because just like last month, there was a new a new site that's confirmed to be older than Clovis First. It's it's a Michigan site and it's fourteen thousand years old. So Clovis First is actually dead. It's a dead theory. So, Neil, this is something that is, is happening not just here in the United States or in North America, per se, though, right? I mean, this is stuff that I'm, I'm hearing this a lot that's happening everywhere. I mean, in Gobekli Tepe, I think, is probably one of the most uh, ardent ones that says, look, there's prehistory all over the place that uh, that's not being kind of taken into the timeline, right? Or the well, official timeline. There's the it, most interesting one, that, most interesting one that comes to mind. Is thinking about uh, Goblekli Tepe and uh, the Rongo Rongo script of Easter Island. I think there's a connection, if I wasn't mistaken, between the scripts found at two locations. And there are, of course, 
half a world away. So the question is, why are they just simply plasma glyphs that are being repeated and we are mistaking it for a, the same language? Or And to recap on that, plasma glyphs, this would have been a, a uh, something that people all over the planet would have been look, able to look up in the sky <coughs> and see uh, day or night, right? They would have been able to see like this supercharged atmosphere type thing, which is why this symbology sort of starts showing up all over the place, right? Yeah, there's a part of me who immediately wants to go, the word is symbolism. Symbolism. Yeah. No, just because it's uh, Boondock Saints. Anyway, great movie. <laughs> um, the, uh, but still, in all seriousness, that's, that's, that, that, that plasma glyph, the, the, especially the ones that we call uh, parat instabilities, are only formed in uh, the, the symbols that you see that were carved into rock are only formed in high amperage discharges of they were talking in excess of um, 1.3 million amps uh, across maybe two inches of space okay. uh, and the, the the manifestation of this discharge over time was created semi-stable um, connections between the two electrodes so this uh, these, however, looked exactly like the petroglyphs that were carved in stone. And to, right down to the oddities of having, for example, um, uh, a ring torus around the whole, for example, the squatter man is the most famous one. That's the one I hear, I, I've yeah. seen the most, yep. And, and it's, it's just so, so well, people know, they can go to the, the Electric Universe Gateway, and if they put in Peratt, P-E-R-A-T-T, -T, his papers will come up really fast, um, and people could see it's, it's uh, there's a couple of the, that are really important, but um, the characteristics of the occurrence of the high current Z-Pinch Aurora is, um, I think, the one that he's most uh, talking about. There's also the evidence for intense solar outbursts. But the these simulations they're simulations, but they are lab based. And they're yes. Just, so they're basically arcing. Is is that what's going on here? Is he's re replicating this uh, imagery via uh, high energy out uh, some discharges of some sort? Oh no, he's not replicating per se. Um, see, he worked for Pratt, Dr. Anthony Pratt works for JPL Laboratory. He's a plasma physicist who, you know, works on nuclear bombs. We're talking about stuff. NASA JPL, so, right? Jet Propulsion yes. Lab. Okay. Yeah. So he's in, he's in, like, he, you know, that's what he does. And he was up there observing the Frontier Conference, by the way. Um, anyway, the, uh, this Pratt instability is uh, something that he, I mean, no one does that. No one dumps uh, 1.3 million amps across two electrodes, and then films it in slow motion to watch the arc, you know, develop over time. But these uh, these patterns became stable. But we also, of course, noticed that they were also on petroglyphs. So what the implication is, is that the amount of current traveling in the poles of the Earth were enough to create that effect. Basically, the uh, a, like, a, like a giant... Uh, a giant man perhaps maybe like holding up the sky like atlas right uh and then of course uh the other one that comes to mind is the holy grail since we're talking about arthur he sent apparently galahad out to find the uh, holy grail now if it was something that that seems to have been coming out of the southern pole and uh, because of course the way that the uh, solar wind uh, I use air quotes there to say solar wind pushes the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, again, air quotes on pushes, but anyway, it creates a. Uh, that's where it would be more visible at night, basically, because it would you would be something that you would suddenly see rising, like a like a man you know, down to the towards the south that is coming out, and and he would look like he has his arms outstretched to the sky and so forth, and. And this imagery is found, trans, like, scribed, painted, carved. Uh, on rocks it, on around rocks. the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's even, uh, I just put out a paper, it's even still in sumo wrestling. I mean, it's worldwide. Yeah. It's worldwide. It just shows I up saw that over and over again, right? uh, I saw that immediately as well, Carrie. I got the, the connection between 
um, sumo wrestling was immediate to me. The moment I realized, oh, that's the sky, okay, and there are two planets or very round gods giving thunder smacks to each other and trying to fight their way out of the sky. That is literally the definition of the Clash of the Titans. The uh, uh, or Odin and and Thor and so forth. Right. The the I think the one of the most fun parts was there's a one particular glyph that had it had all of the above. It had the yin and the yang. Uh, so there were two spheres, and then in one iteration of it in Chinese history, right? Because these these came from different Shang bones and different seals. There was one looked like exactly like a man stomping with his feet doing the Yokozuna dance. Mm-hmm. And um, all of it was to do with the the Japanese word for yokozuna, which is the top samurai. So it, I mean, it's all over when you when you finally see it, um, it. It's it's unmissable. It's it's in every culture. It's in the Rongo Rongo scripts, like you mentioned. It's, <laughs> well, it's, it's on it's their in masks. Egyptian culture. It's everywhere. Every, in, in, your, in your samurai masks, that you were when you mentioned samurai, I immediately reminded of those scary masks that they wore. Mm-hmm. Uh, in battle, but that that's a depiction of the same thing. Tiki masks are the same thing as well. They have that weird look to them. Uh, you, I think, uh, Matt, you know what I was talking about if you saw them. They, they have like, they have, uh, a, instead of having a man, instead of the the arms outstretched and the legs outstretched being the squatter man with the right. two dots on either side, it is depicted from the point of view of the Tahitians, or people in that area to be eyebrows. Well, I watched so the, those guys. The, 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 no, give me a second. The yeah. eyebrows themselves were yeah. the, where the arms were, and the two dots were either the bright red spots on the cheeks or the eyes, and that is the mask that you might see with big with big teeth smiling at the bottom. Right. You have a meaning? You might have seen that. That that is the exact same de- yep. form depicted in a completely yep. different way. I was watching those guys do those haiku dance. Was that what they're called? No, they're not. The no, haiku is a poetic thing. What's that called? The the, <laughs> the New Zealanders do that uh, like the, war. I forget the name of it. But the, you're talking about the Maori, and that, yes, exactly. They do that it's like the war same, dance. The and if you watch yeah. their body movements and the positions they put themselves. They're doing that. Uh, yes. it's like holy crap. There it is again. It's like you're right. It's everywhere once you once you notice it. Now those dots um, are the thing that make. They, they make the difference between a hieroglyph and a plasma glyph because when you talk about you when you're looking at different types of glyph you look for the artist encoding specific information that is not ordinary and those mm-hmm. dots are not anatomical it's just like it, in ohio you have the great serpent mound it used to be in front of the quote egg which is actually venus there used to be a bow shock kind of formation as a mound, and I forget what the name of that is, there's a physics name for what goes in front of the comet. And mm. that, that mound has been lost or uh, maybe plowed out for inconvenience because, of course, no snake has anything in, in front of itself. And these dots that are outside and below the armpits of the squatter man are actually just the bright rings formed because of, there's a torus going around. Now these torus, this torus can extend. It can it can be more than just a single torus. It can be several of them, and in which case you'll get often these centipede glyphs or snake glyphs. You'll get all sorts of formations just depending on the angle that they saw it in and how how strong the the current was flowing right. and how or, stable or, how stable how stable the the uh, what are called the um, double layers the plasma double layers were. There be ladder to heaven. Or, or yeah, stairway to heaven yeah, exactly, would be the, two, yeah. the other words. Yeah, I can see why. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I assume that in the Arthurian tales that Galahad would have been like Venus, or not Venus, sorry, uh, Mercury or something. So it's not to say though um, that there is no diffusion. There is definitely diffusion because people were. It's like the Sea Peoples, right? This is well known diffusion. For some reason, people in the mainstream attack diffusionism, but. The most uh, talked about diffusion is the the Sea Peoples. Nobody knew where they came from and who they were exactly. And uh, it's also well known that the Chinese were all about traveling all over. And we've also got uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs in Australia that have been deciphered by Egyptologists. And China. 
Yeah, and in China. And so we know that diffusion is the norm. Um, people were constantly on the lookout for new territory, uh, new lands, a place to be safe. Maybe sometimes their own land had been destroyed, like the Welsh had to leave when that comet passed over. Yeah. And so diffusion is also happening. And so we need a way to talk about which one is which, because uh, some of these formations in America, some of the mounds and such, might be purely what, what most Americans consider Native American. And then some of those mounds are going to be related to other cultures that came here and they had their own way of building things. And you have to look at the original culture to see what were their building techniques and compare them with what was here. Um, there is some pretty good evidence that the Cahokians came from Central or South America. Uh, however, if you ask the mainstream, they'll categorically deny that is a possibility. While at the same time, if you go to Cahokia today and you go to the to the uh, museum there, the visitor center, they will right. depict they will depict them as a half naked savage people, which is ridiculous in the in the weather that belongs to Missouri. Uh, it's just not going to happen that they're going to dress like that. If any, if people, there's actually photos in that museum of Native Americans from the 1800s and how well they are dressed and how beautifully they are dressed and how diverse and colorful and just fantastic these cultures were. And yet, throughout the entire museum, they're depicted in, in loincloths, which is tropical stuff, yeah. right? That's not what you would see in a temperate environment. So the mainstream has this narrative they want to keep and they want to push. And it is a hard, is, is a bit of a throwback to the Victorian Egyptology. You could kind of trace the, the attitudes, the same attitudes from Victorian Egyptology back to England and then over to uh, vertebrate archaeology here in America. But uh, the main issue that I see is that um, nobody wants to challenge that narrative. Or if you do, again, they'll take the same things. Like he mentioned those, um, those stone buildings, and they'll, they won't even call them... Uh, you know, out of place artifacts, they'll just go ahead and say that, that they're something that they clearly aren't. Uh, like chunky stones, yeah. they'll call they'll, they'll call them these chunky stones, and they'll make up a game. There is no writing evidence for any kind of game involving throwing donut shaped stones. But what there are in Europe, there are these stones that are very similar that are used for, of course, weaving things that make sense. You know, and and it's just a common problem. There's a whole categorical list. It, it would be the kind of museum that we would need would be completely different because it would not only have the electro uh, magnetic cosmology and talk about plasma in ways that people aren't used to, right? But it would cover history in a way that people aren't used to, and and give people updates on things like you know the at the search for Atlantis has gotten way more interesting since 2015. <laughs> there have been literally I I think five underwater. I mean, they're yeah. all in my paper. Uh, you know, unboxing Atlantis because we need to unbox Atlantis and talk about um, how it is looking more and more likely that Solon was not told a pack of lies uh, and Plato wasn't just, you know, making things up, but that was a real it conversation. It doesn't seem that likely. Happened. Yeah, it doesn't seem likely, but that's been the, the narrative. But, but also, we've got, to, we've got to undo that. Also, uh, considering the possibility of what it might have been. Um, which which is something we've talked before is is those things that I've and this was agreed upon by some other people is that uh, when we were discussing it was if something happens where you can see that the uh, time the the stuff that we see as the as something um, uh, technologically advanced for their time uh, it seems that it would be something akin to Mm. keeping some knowledge uh, alight in the monasteries after Rome fell. It has that feeling to it. As a po So basically, those things, people that we call ancient Egyptians are actually um, the inheritors of the technology that survived the previous yeah. world yeah. prior to that one that seems to have been the one that did truly megalithic things. Right. Uh, perhaps by virtue of the world being different. Yes, uh, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I, I and in fact, in my um, origins of uh, religions, I 
have my own timeline set up and I put the megalithic period actually before the transition period because it does appear to me that the major movement to build megalithic architecture, the original movement, uh, happened as a result of honoring these gods and the cataclysmic events. And then any of the megalithic architecture we see later uh, it tended to be a, a recreation, a rethinking, a, a re invigorating of those ancient religions and you see that with the so-called adena which I, is really the alegui people and then later the hopewell people and then later the fort ancient people um and so the this need to reinvigorate the past and then of course information has been lost and when information is mm -hmm. lost it's like the pyramids the original ziggurats and then from the ziggurats they build these great uh pyramids and then it all devolves and then they start building these other pyramids from falling apart ziggurats and then when they build pyramids after that they just get worse and worse in quality so there is information that was originally had and it was lost and that that's in the 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 priest telling solon that his people the people from the um greek area that they were kind of like babies that they were forgetting how many times that they had been uh destroyed and that they originally themselves were basically Atlanteans. They were like kind of an outpost of, of the Atlantean culture. So there's... That's, a, oh, that's bold. It, it is bold, but that's, that's in the... That's in the um, it's implied in the, in the quotes from the high priest. And so when we look at, at Africa, if you go to Google Earth and you look, there is signs of major mega tsunamis going across. There could be untold civilizations that have been lost there. And then, you know, there have been some new works... Uh, well, it wouldn't have to be water. I mean, no, it wouldn't. The, the, the I agree. inundation I agree. of sand. Uh, there, although there have some been know. some whale bodies, and there's been uh, salt water. <laughs> there's been some. Uh, there's been salt water found inland in Mauritania, and then there's also been again whale um, skeletons that are not fossilized found. So I, I personally oh, think a, oh, oh, there, there, there was, have been a couple of, of events that have happened there that have been separated by thousands and it, thousands especially of Especially if the, uh, quote, Clash of the Titans event is as depicted either in Velikovskian or uh, in the Talbot-type uh, uh, reconstructions where um, you would have had um, one and or several planets above one side of our planet, which would be like to the north. This conjunction was wondrous and beautiful while there was the thing that we were talking about, the squatter man, coming up at the south. So this is what the earth sat in. It had rings. It was, you know, uh, the moon wasn't there yet. Everything was great. Uh, maybe they were doing some wonderful building and they had a relatively long period of time of relative peace to uh, play with the world to come up with some ways to... Uh, you know, harness this and or that. But the uh, mass of that planet uh, would be several times more than the moon and just holding water up to the north and, of course, all, conversely to the south because that's how the tides work. And um, making it very much lower along the middle of the planet. Uh, and then, of course those would go off fighting in space, trying to blast each other, and then the water would have resettled. And that resettling would have been, uh, it, it, even with it, with or without combined melting of ice caps, none of that even, it would just been absolutely devastating. So when Neil talks, when you talk through this stuff, man, one of the things I love about the way you do this, I, I hate to interrupt, but I would like for you to expand, Neil. if you wouldn't mind, because... Okay, so the, the, we've got to kind of set the premise here, and that is that what you're explaining is that there are ancient like writings and things where, we, where you, you guys were proposing what these folks were talking about was actually what they were seeing in the sky, and they were describing these actual like planetary events and things that they could see with their naked eye that was happening. But it's funny because when you, because you go back and forth between what was happening in the sky and sort of what the texts are saying. And you weave this story together, but that you're pulling from both of those sources when you're explaining this stuff. So when you're saying I the water was held to the north, you're not talking prophetically or anything like that anymore. You're talking uh, physics were Literally. at play and water was being held to the north. This isn't like some uh, you know prophetic biblical type thing you're discussing th at that point, right? Oh no, uh, well, 
it's literally biblical, but not um, biblical like I'm trying to talk about the Bible. It just so happens this I like am. Part in the Red Sea um, is kind of... Uh, part in the Red Sea, yes, takes yeah. things, yes. Yeah. But uh, what what I'm, what is... Like for example, we'll have a debate. Uh, the debate is actually for me and sh- me and uh, uh, Shifu Kariaga here yeah. is uh, what happened in the sky, not if they were looking to the sky for inspiration. Uh, we're both under the impression that the symbols later became holy or divine because they were depicting things. Right in the sky that are no longer around today. Right. Like the aurora borealis blows our friggin' mind just seeing this little footprint. But if we could imagine that the aurora borealis, just in your mind, just ten times stronger, a hundred times stronger, a thousand times stronger, and the shape it would start making as this, the this, uh, you could start seeing the entire magnetic field of the Earth from from the surface of the Earth. Right, and then. If other planets in space, you could start seeing their comas around those planets. Uh, if nothing else, if the planets are not moving, okay, if that argument is that you can say that no, that's not happening at all, you could still see these comas clear as day. They would have had a big effect. But there's a lot of evidence to say that we did see these planets up close. For example, yeah. Jupiter being described as a banded god, a yeah. god in chains. Yeah, and, by, uh, and by people who didn't the, have telescopes. The, the, there's an entire <laughs> Sumerian glyph that shows all of the all of the planets. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. it's got them all on there. And they didn't. And they didn't have. Seal, I think. Yeah, they yeah. didn't have. Uh, they didn't have lens glass, uh, or we'd find it right. They didn't have the tools that we use today to see these things at great distances. They right. There's no maybe, evidence they had any telescopic. Right. Uh, that that wasn't part of the astrological science. And so what's However, that? it would not in any way surprise me with no. their ability to sh- to. I mean, we look at what we couldn't understand about uh, the uh, the 2,000-year-old computer built by uh, Archimedes. The, yeah, the, it's, it's probable, the, it's probable that the Mayans had some technology because they have these extremely large sheets of mica that are very polished and, and perfect, and they went to extraordinary lengths to protect them from the Spanish uh, or somebody, mm-hmm. uh, some invaders, and they would, and they would bury them. And uh, they've even found a couple of them in in pretty good shape. I mean, they're not in perfect shape anymore, but they were. Uh, and you could tell exactly that they were very, very large sheets of mica. So they were probably doing something, um, making it convex a little bit, uh, so that they could do observations. Um, we don't have any other good reason why they would have these uh, large sheets of mica. I mean, they were very expensive to get. We're talking they they would go all the way to. Uh, either South Carolina, or there's some evidence that they went all the way to Brazil. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that's you think about the logistics of shipping that in in. Um, it was important. In old boats reason, yeah. in old style boats. I mean, it would be very difficult. Actually, to to tell you straight up, there there's a really good reason to do that. Number one, they they were in two sheets. They were at the top of the pyramid. Uh, they were um, thirty feet by 30 feet or so on each side, okay, and they were 10 inches thick. That's an unprecedented slab of mica to yeah. move unbroken. Now, mica comes off in very thin sheets. Uh, now, I was surprised that you didn't know this, that mica is extremely useful in what is called uh, in electrical engineering. Uh, in fact, one of, my, one of my projects, I use mica to electrically separate, uh, but thermally couple two objects. So it allows heat transfer, uh, but it does not allow the transmission of electricity across it. It is an electrical insulator, uh, 100%. So um, it would electrically separate the top of the pyramid from the bottom of the pyramid, and... Uh, one of the things that initially came to mind when I started looking at some of the Mayan architecture was the way that the rain was designed to fall down the pyramid and go in and out of the pyramid. Like it would go in mm. through a wall and then out along an edge and then in through a wall in a crack and then out through an edge and so on. And it would go all the way down the pyramid. Now, it seemed 
pointless to some. And then I realized what we were, might be looking at when I thought about things like, for example, the burning bush that did not burn. Uh, when when figuring that out, you realize that the principle of what they were doing was uh, they had a watered a tree or plant, and it was uh, conducting through its roots to uh, the water table below, and reaching up through a very dry sand, and then uh, which is an insulator, uh, up through a the a, a mountain top in a perhaps a storm or something, yeah. and. And now you have this tree that's electrically connected to the water table. It is the only point for miles around for electrons to get through that sand and get out into where it wants to go to the atmosphere. And such, the bush begins to burn. Uh, but not really burn. It's just shedding electrons for things around it. It's not a chemical reaction. So given... So it's, you're saying it kind of... So that would kind of make sense, because if we're saying that... For, for whatever reason, aurora borealises were happening so bright that you could see them everywhere, that kind of thing. So the, the Earth, mm-hmm. was some, for some reason, was in an electrically supercharged state of being. It and, seems so, yes. And because of that, uh, these other phenomena, visible phenomena, would take place. And if we discount that, then we're, we're, we're only interpreting that data through the lens of today, which may not actually be accurate. It, you're saying that, that there could be... Well, Go ahead. The myths, the myths are pretty, um, despite whatever the audience may think or feel about this subject, the myths are very clear that the, the solar arrangement that we had before was totally different. And in some, uh, some of the myths, it suggests that we did not have, or at least in, it was not close enough for the sun to look like a god and that it looked small enough to be like all, all the other stars, albeit brighter, um, but that we were in a different electrical environment because we were around two uh, what we call gas giants now, but they were essentially uh, brown dwarf stars at the time. Now, they're, they have since sh- their, their behaviors have changed, and that might have to do with some change in the sun, or um, it could be that the uh, somehow the arrangement was was altered. There was a change in uh, the potential in our place in the solar system. Uh, I mean, in the in the galaxy, because the galaxy is not a flat disk. That's so, that's one of those new things that have been discovered. The the shape mm. of the galaxy is not not a flat uh, spiral disk. It is on, on a wave. And so, you know, our position changing over time in that it may change the overall potential around the sun. The sun's behavior may have changed, and that may have changed the relationship with these gas giants, um, which were, again, uh, definitely and still putting out more heat than they absorb. And they're very uh, electromagnetically powerful. And so the environment in which the Earth was surrounded uh, uncategorically, according to not only that evidence, but also when you look at um, the uh, things like red blood, red green color blindness in people and in animals, and you look at the uh, plants, re- you know, reflecting green, even though the sun puts out tons of green. Um, there is no doubt that we had a different environment, and the sky was even a different color. And this is in record, not in only one culture but in cultures that are separated the entire world around. So they are not diffused. Um, cultures and you're, you know this. Other. You actually know this 100% when you realize the depiction in your head when you when someone goes, okay, the sun, okay, guy, the sun. Uh, Egyptian, depiction of the sun, okay. And you go Horus, okay. And then you see it's on top of the, the bird's head, or the hawk head. I'm not sure if it's a bird or hawk, whatever it is. And then you will see it is a red disc yeah. with a yellow serpent around it. The yellow serpent, the Urea serpent, is, you can see, has a little tail popping out on one side and a little head popping out on the other on the bottom. Well, that is interesting because it depicts polarity on the sun, meaning the south is somehow a little bit tufting a bit more than the north but that's not uncommon ours our planet does that and jupiter has stronger stuff going to the south of it as well and in depiction in the past it seemed that the south what the current south pole of jupiter had almost looked like a a throne in some case it was so uh potent the magnetic field you could see it and of course 
the magnetic field of Jupiter is absolutely huge. So uh, it would be the largest thing in the sky if we could see it. And, like, that, and that's that, how big it is. That's that disk, too. If, if people look at the glyph, think about this. The Great Pyramid, to this day, is better aligned and more perfectly symmetric than any ancient object and in some ways more aligned than any construction would require today. And yet, that disk in that hieroglyph is not a sphere. And we know one thing about the sun is it is strangely spherical. I mean, it's not perfectly spherical, but it's very spherical. And this, this, uh, the glyph that he's talking about, it's always depicted in an egg shape. And, mm. and so the, the magnetosphere itself uh, was oblate. And that is not something, that's not a detail that the Egyptians would have missed. And besides, we have the Greek stories of Apollo growing like a child and, and coming into his own. And we know that there's this passage from father to son of this power. And it's in every culture. It's in the Norse mm-hmm. culture and the Hindu culture. And, and all the whole world has these stories of either two brothers or a father-son fight. Um, and, and this not even getting to the, the male-female issue, just the, the stars themselves. Um, and, and that there are stories from the Mayans and the Aztecs of, of how Saturn used to be green, and then later yeah. on out pops this green Venus, and we know that Venus used to be uh, the green morning star because of even in Western traditions going back to the Greeks and Romans, they talked about uh, her being green, her hair being green, etc. Um, so th- these things we know about them, and we even have occasionally. I'll, there'll be a like a saying, you know, an anachronism, and when I say it, I go, "My gosh, where did that come from uh, originally?" And you know that the only way that it makes sense is it is it harkens back to a wisdom, you know, almost like an old wives' tale uh, that goes all the way on back, and it's not just the days of the week. Or the month names, <clears throat> it's it's huge parts of our culture that that harken back to this age of the <laughs> gods and the titans. And if when people go looking for it, you can't miss it. No, uh, I'll give you one that the automatically comes to mind. It was instantly uh, if you understand that uh, plasma inherently twists around itself and sort of makes a double helix type of uh, formation, or and you can see this in uh, prominences that are thrown off the sun and stuff, things like that. Well, the symbol, the universal symbol for good luck is crossing your fingers, which is a literal depiction of that. And we carried that forever, like literally good luck or I'm being deceptive. One of the two, you know, that's an interesting one. I had never thought of that one. Mm -hmm. And um, the symbol uh, even gets uh, worse when you start, well, not that particular symbol, but when we were talking about planets and you wanted to know about the literal depiction, well, uh, the argument is, as we were showing, you can say, okay, this is what it looked like, this is what it looked like, here's some depictions, here's some stories. Um, but the real thing that people like Velikovsky and others are proposing is that planets were on different courses as well, and that we, ourselves, our, our planet, was in a conjunction with several other planets uh, orbiting the sun. And this, um, the rings of Saturn, when looked at from below, would appear as if an eye. And the plasma of the northern lights reaching from the northern circle, the Arctic Circle, upwards towards this object would appear as if a tree or green tree or whatever with perhaps maybe a snake twirling around it which would be the uh, the gristle world tree with the um, the dragon going for the roots or the snake in the garden of eden or a christmas tree or the eye and the pyramid of providence thing all of those are the same exact symbol uh and so when you're looking at in from that context then you from all these different cultures they are the exact same story being told in archetype but not um given different contexts because although the archetype's the same the story to depict them was from their point of view and right. their culture made a story to tell uh what's going on because they only had limited vocabulary this is basically 
we call it myth. In my mind, they were the first scientific yes. uh, depictions. They were trying to tell you what they saw. Today, we would depict them, I would say, well, you're getting a 1.3 amp gigahertz discharge going through uh, its phases of metamorphosis here. As you can see in this particular form, it's doing this. You're getting these twists. This is because of the right-hand rule of the plasma and the cellular structure, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But to them, they go, the wiggling snake started doing yeah. its funky stuff. Right. You know, that, what else could they say? They, don't, they, they, had to, to show, they had to tell right. someone else. They didn't have this vocabulary that we have today. I've kind of always felt that either. way. About like and the, I want to I add to the power of what he just said. I want people to go right now, because they're on the computer, and go Google search Saturn South Pole and go to the images. You're going to notice two things. One, you're going to see the eye, and number two, you're going to see a, the hexagon shape with the central eye. eye. Now, in Kentucky, and people can go on Amazon if they want to buy this book, there's a book called The Rock Art of Kentucky, and it has this exact glyph has been carved into a rock shelter here in, uh, in Kentucky, and it is a hexagon. And in the center of that hexagon, is a, it, they have carved it in such a way that it gives an embossed hemispherical shape. Um, so a, the artist, went, these astrologic uh, scientists of the Native Americans, went through incredible lengths to depict exactly what they were seeing up there within reasonable margins of error, considering what of they're course. using. And there is no other explanation for this uh, glyph. There's no official explanation given at all. It's, again, one of those uparts that is lost to academia because there's no major money and there's no way to get a grant and there's just no, there's nothing there for anybody to write a major paper about it. It's never been explained. And any time you have that in science... That that's a uh oh, right? Mm -hmm. Because because later somebody can but come you know it's held dear, and do something with that. But you know it's held dear <laughs> because uh, what you've just depicted, everything you just said there, is literally, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Masonic. The black cube, the tetragrammatron, the uh, uh, the the worship of of Saturn, the Eye of Providence. Uh, all of these things uh, sort of uh, are really come together in that, in that uh, I don't want to call it a religion, I'm not sure, that club, <laughs> Well, uh, the, the organization. It's ironic you bring that up. Uh, a man just basically decided to become my, my medical student, and he could, mm -hmm. he, he'll be able to tell us because he's a Freemason, so we'll get him on sometime. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Well, it, but hey, but well, the, wait, it's, it's not, full, the, full not, I'm not depicting any weird evil stuff when I say that. I literally <laughs> am just simply looking at it, and you go, well, look at the symbolism. Look at what yeah. they're depicting. Well, uh, clearly, um, and... and, and, and it's almost uh, it would it, in some ways there was a good reason to be to hide it because it would be heretical to the powers that be because what they were trying to do is create divinity for the sun uh, based on the divinity of the old and they destroyed the old the Saturnian right. uh, or Saturnalia or all that of that culture yes. and all of those had to be sort of encompassed or yes written out and wrapped around that's why the cross that we see the the holy cross with the uh the four streamers or which is very good a depiction of atlantis the four streamers or pathways which of course these uh this now gets attributed to to jesus it's it goes to it goes to the sun right but it used to be another god the father which was the first god the Catholic right. god with the big beard that was likely the North Pole gentleman. Uh, the land was beautiful when he was there. Captain God with the big beard was leaning down in the King Arthur and sense, hey, land is good. Then King uh, dies and sails away on burning fire or uh, the Ark sails away, whatever the motif you choose. The dismembered corpse of whomever goes floating away. Uh, this is the Battle of the Titans where they, they travel off into space together fighting. Jupiter's going, I hate you. And the other one going, I hate you too. And they blast each other to bits and probably blow a few planets up along the way. And they're going out that way, but now the, our water just rebalanced on the planet. So a whole whack of people just died. Uh, most of the civilizations are now underwater. Uh, people are picking up out of the rubble. Yep. There's 
no one the, the story is being told of course but after that people are scared out of their freaking minds whatever they could salvage from before the before times because they could hold on to it uh but this also kind of means then that finding atlantis might not be something we could ever do because if true then Solon's depiction of atlantis is actually the mount olympus of the greeks the uh the it's could a, be. It's, it's, a, it's it's something it's in very space well could be but it would mean it would mean then that even though we called that the holy place in space, you know, because like, it would be on top of a mountain or the four rivers or pathways and the concentric circles, very very Saturnian in the uh, in the depictions of Atlantis. But uh, it would seem to imply then that the cultures all around the world, the seafaring people that came up this way, were all relatively advanced. But they wouldn't be after this. You know, like, like right. there'd, there'd yeah, be nothing. Be. I mean, everyone who survived would be going, dude, the, like, what the F just happened here, okay? <laughs> you know, we just crawled out. And, of course, that's, that's just water. That's not including the the electrical things that might have been happening. Right. Well, and the blasting wind, and making mountains. Yeah. It burning was... entire peoples, completely gone forever. You know, uh, I mean, unless, until we decide to go lift that mountain up and take a look, which uh, perhaps in the future we'll be able to do. But... <laughs> um, you know, uh, it seems that some structures in it, like when they talked about the rock wall in Texas, the the idea that this was buried uh, in massive, uh, you know, the ma- ma- uh, this whole town or whatever was there was buried uh, is very compelling. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of evidence that this and this this is the antediluvian stuff. This is things that were hit, you know, like three thousand ton rocks were just just like knocked over. Um, so, uh, this, and, and of course the, the, the cool thing is that in the depiction we were talking about, if you want to get biblical there, Matt, Matt, the, the idea that it was not only sitting upon the North pole, but it was vaporizing the landscape around the top of the North pole, as you can see from satellite imagery of Baffin Island and the, the fjords. The land just sort of goes and then literally drops straight down to nothing. It's gone. And that's what fjords are like because it was eaten away and lifted away. Um, the same, it just crisscrosses uh, all across uh, what it's etching up, pulling that material up into like a, like a, a, a very high, like all into space high amount of fog uh, that is basically like um, a fog bank or perhaps like a great back of a of a turtle or elephant. So we're so ta- you're talking about this. What like, talking about. Yeah, these high energy... becoming satellites, which were considered Tiamat gathering an army, which is yeah. Uh, so this is this is the lightning yeah. or the. Uh, I want to point out too before we move on that this battle about the old worship versus the new was is it was we're talking Moses versus Joshua kind of stuff. Yeah, you had. Groups of people at that time, idolatry literally meant the worship of planets, and there were people who were stuck on the old gods. And now, it was a different age, and Moses was basically trying to get them to stop because there there was no evidence anymore that they needed to worship those gods. They had a a theological argument, and and it's been it's been reinterpreted. I'm not going to say misinterpreted, but I'm going to say it's re, been reinterpreted. Uh, based on the needs, of course, of Constantinople and 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 others, but the point being is that there was an old way of religion, and then there was a new way of religion. Well, okay, for for everyone to for everyone to know, Matt, and please, I would not interrupt again, but for everyone to really get this in a better understanding, is to think of it this way: uh, Thor Ragnarok, okay, the movie we've probably all seen, all that stuff. Odin is Saturn. The, the go- captain god with the big beard, okay, one eye, okay, and then his son replaces him, okay, right. that's literally the story, well, that's not changed, and basically the battle between Moses and his worshippers who were going, no, no, we, we're going with the cow thing, we, we, you were up in the mountain, we went with the cow thing, we're going with the cow thing, we're cool with that, you're not cool with that, you're not, <laughs> okay, he's not cool with that, anyway, so, uh, but they were doing their depictions, uh, whatever it was, the same. It's the same argument, dude. Uh, this god is no longer king, captain god up there. He's gone. He's the, the land is shit. Look, look what's happening. I mean, they, you, we got twenty four hour sunlight with this green light in the sky that made the entire northern planet incredibly lush, 
beautiful. It's like the Garden of Eden up here. I think that's what we'll call that. Okay, we'll call it the Garden of Eden. Good, good call. We'll go with that. So <laughs> they're doing this wonderful thing, but now it's like a desert. It's all messed up. We're all dying here, and we should go with new gods. What do you think? Uh, and he's like, yeah, new gods. And they're like, no, we go with the old gods, and this is the argument, basically, in a nutshell. Uh, do you go with Thor, or are you going to go with... And this is back in the, what? 2000 BC, 1200 BC, something right. like that, in that rough area. Uh, that changed again, of course, uh, when you get closer uh, to uh, when the when everything finally like chilled out about 700 BC or so. Uh, it, it continued along. We we sort of worshipped these things that didn't exist anymore: hedonism, Romans, all that wonderful stuff. And then it was like, uh, no, sun worship only. Sun worship only. Yep. Sun worship only. Why? Because it's the only thing left in the sky to, to worship. Yeah, it's the only thing that, that you can point right, to. That because provides if, you, life. if you worship yep. the moon, you are literally living with sin because sin is the name of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. this is what we're talking about. And these people lived. I mean, this is a, a story that everyone knew. And it was a. And this. And the. 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 the um, idea that this thing was uh, holding up uh, all of the water. Now, what I was trying to get with that wonderful collage was just at the end is to say, so when that all left and the water rebounds the first time, that was bad enough, okay? I mean, you already know that's bad enough. But in the story of Moses or Noah, 40 days and 40 nights. So all of that vaporized material over the that was being held up, electrically etched material, is now going to, uh, and, and all the moisture that was being held up, uh, especially in the northern hemisphere, is now gone. So it all has to leave the atmosphere. It's, it's no longer able. The atmosphere is no longer capable of sustaining that much water. So it begins to rain a lot. So uh, to add insult to injury, you're also screwed. Even if you made through that, you have 40 days of just sheer downpour, flooding everything. Still, after you're still flooding. After this like, tsunami, it's amazing like event, anyone right? survived that literally. Yeah. And well, and anybody that would have been uh, a coastal city at the time would have been wiped out immediately. So it would have set everything back: travel, intercontinental travel. Everything would have been set back, right? It, necessarily. Well, you, you, it, even worse than that, the only thing we have from that time are some of these tales about the golden age. That's it. Yeah, there's there's, there's nothing left. I mean, people. I mean, the Egyptians who, who who survived that were going. So, what do we have from the Great Pyramid? So, imagine you had you had the the um, the Hoover Dam is like the Great Pyramid. Okay, so they're in here inside the Hoover Dam. They go. I think we might be able to get it up and running again. Maybe I think maybe. Okay. Um, well, what did you figure out? And he goes, well, we figured out if we put salt and cardboard together here, a uh, wood pulp, we can make a, ba a, a battery with some wine. And they're like, okay. So we've recovered that technology. <laughs> what else do we got? We got coils. We got to recover some of that technology. And these type of things. So this is what they could recover themselves, trying to uh, dig through their own past of places that were less hit than others. Um, you know, Egypt uh, might have uh, survived better. I don't know, uh, but the point was is that um, to uh, to uh, Cariega's uh, or Cariega's um, um, benefit or to 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 back him up there, uh, the stuff that came after later, it would be like us going, well, okay, we need to generate more power. You know what we should do? We should just go and block off another river. It worked for them. Yeah, good idea. And they just went and built another pyramid. But okay, they go, right. hmm, this one's not working. Well, it's a pile of stones. Like that's a pile of stones. I've heard Robert Shaw like, talk you, you about that. Really, yeah, they're not. Too. They're said, not able to. They can build the stone, but it's just like it's like a cargo cult, almost trying to build planes. You know, I think to, what, it was Robert Shaw who was saying that they built that, like things like the pyramids were temples that were built on top of temples that were built on top of temples that were built on top of temples. Oh like yeah, these, the red pyramid yeah. has a well underneath of it. If you didn't know that, the red pyramid has a yeah. well underneath it, and that well. That well is actually, if you look at it, the well is well worn. I, and I don't mean as a joke. I mean it is, it has been weathered by water for thousands of years prior to a pyramid building being built on top of it. So it became a holy site of some sort for some reason of significance that was just built on top of. Well, and I, well, I, well, I, well let's, let's was, be. 
a discontinuity or there was if it, it, the sky was that energetic, then perhaps there was there were such a thing as ley lines and the crossing of these things across the ground. When they did that, they they sort of uh, going yeah. to these places that were quote unquote holy to try to harness the quote unquote holy power. It, it wouldn't make any difference if I saw a place that glowed with ball lightning and lights. Yeah, uh, that's where I'd head. If I, I mean, that's why people well, migrate all the way to Ireland God trying to get there. Further. That's why. That's why Wudong Mountain is where where it's at, and then Wudong Mountain itself yeah. appears to be an electrically formed place, and there are still electrical events that happen there, and that is the temple in China for the thunder god uh, Xuanwu, or mm-hmm. Junwu, depending on how you want it, which dialect you want to right. pronounce. It's important for people to understand when we're talking about holy and religious. If you put your mind back then, science and oh yeah, I got to stress on not religious. They were, so, all, but I call it holy and divine. So <laughs> they were all that way because we're talking about the force, the power, the Tao. It mm. was all heaven the was energy, a literal. Yeah. Yep. It was the sky and and the planet, but it was also this force of tremendous strength. And to this day, behind everything, people have found uh, have brought me photographs of plasma balls. Mm-hmm. that have emerged, and they're not ball lightning, but they're clouds of plasma that have emerged out of the ground yeah, plasma. Here, here at uh, the... So we have a sandstone ley line that is, goes from Tennessee up to Ohio, um, which is... the Most of it is the Daniel Boone National Forest. It is a different formation uh, than the rest of the Appalachians. And <clears throat> people living there see things coming out of the ground. So imagine if mm-hmm. there was a lot more electricity uh, in the environment, in the air. Um, not only would the volcanoes be more active, and you'd have more of these Vesuvius-type events, and but you would have and earthquakes, and, and just... Uh, it would be terrible in, in many ways, but it would be awe-inspiring in, in, in all sorts of ways to be religious. I mean, to this day, think about how many people got religious over the Boxer Day Rebellion, or Boxer Day... Uh, Tsunami. Sorry, I'm mixing my events. Mm. The Boxer Day tsunami caused all sorts of people to Boxing vote. Boxing Day. Boxing Day. Boxing day. Not, and, not British, are you? No. no. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> people got super religious over that uh, that event, and they still do for all sorts of earthquakes and tornadoes. And, and just imagine then the kind of power... Uh, that we're talking. There's a video that I recommend well, people watch on think the, of the story uh, of Chicken Little. On that the, story alone. Yes. The sky yeah. is falling. The sky is falling. These. Let me, let that's, me, it's, let me been, it's been languishing for so long. People have got to watch this video of. Um, I guess his name is uh, Andy Hall. That's it, Andy Hall. Mm, yes, Andy. Uh, the 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 video is on the Thunderbolts project, uh, and it is. Um, it's Earth Catastrophism, and it is a video all about the formation of mountains that absolutely cannot be from tectonic upthrust or from erosion. When you watch the video, and he makes he demonstrates for you these waveforms, and they absolutely are mathematical, and they're related to wind. And to think about the kind of... Well, shock waves. Heat, shock waves, yeah. yes, shock waves. The, the types of wind and, and waves and the heat that it would take to lay these layers, these triangular buttress shapes, the size of mountains. Um, even if they're not Everest-sized mountains, I climbed still one. They're very large. Yeah, they're, they're, they're impressive. And, uh, and then here in Kentucky, we have the, the Knobs region, which is, again, its own geological formation, and there are Lichtenberg formations there. And we're talking, these hills are 900 feet tall. And they all are 900 feet tall, except for uh, just a couple. And to to get that kind of even flow, and then you you know Stone Mountain and Ayers Mountain and Devil's Tower, um, and probably half uh, Half Dome as well. But uh, that would have been a super super ancient event. But uh, it's just people have got to understand this kind of power would totally change our thinking even today, as modern as we think we are. If this kind of power, if we witnessed it firsthand, and for example, the Hebrews, of course, seeing the Red Sea lift up, um, that would change our behavior instantly. It would change our beliefs over overnight. Actually, I was uh, I was going to uh, mention that's one of the th- reasons why uh, one of the 
one of the people are even though he's not electric universe related directly a lot of people in the eu community have a bit of love for a man named julian james who came up with the book in the 1970s called the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind now it's basically an essay describing um how people thought differently uh, in the past. And he couldn't understand why there was a change, but somewhere around 2,700 years ago, people started talking like Odysseus and stopped talking like people in the Iliad. Uh, in Homer's the Iliad, people were talking to the gods all the time, getting direction from them, and did what the gods say and could not disobey. That's alien thinking to us. Uh, Odysseus behaves like us, like a person saw, presented with a problem. And he must uh, think his way through it and then get home. The, uh, the difference between the two is so striking that uh, when he started going through and realizing that before a certain period of time, all speech that human beings uttered was literal. And that is not something we're used to. We are very much used to metaphor and uh, allegory and allusion and... Uh, innuendo that makes us smile there's like a little the thing literally that makes us smile somehow has to do with the dichotomy of these of words that are funny and we go ha ha these people didn't seem to laugh very much okay the people who were literal were like like and, and it makes a lot of sense if i was there and i was born under the fact that i could see the gods in the sky they not just metaphorically i mean there he is right there and when they get close to the surface they occasionally burn everyone alive. So we are scared of them. Got it? Got it. Okay, we worship them and do everything for them. Got it? Got it. Good. And that's what you're taught, and that's the way it is, and that's how you think. And there's absolutely no way you can argue with that point because you see the gods, and they do do this, and they do move, and they don't like you. So the way that they, that culture, when that's the gods stopped, when the flare-up of Venus stopped and, and, and uh, Lucifer, the, the morning star, was tried to rival the sun in brightness or the god in brightness and was struck down. Okay, once that happened and everything sort of chilled out and the sky sort of went to what it is today, uh, it only took a couple hundred years before people were like, what the hell is with all these books? Right. Like, they, they're talking, like, this is crazy stuff, Right. Yeah, I know the old guys. The old guys are telling us tales and stuff, but I think uh, we could learn a lot from them," said Plato when he was younger. And then he was like, when he got older, he was like, "These people are nuts. We should just kill them all off." <laughs> so he was, he was like, not like he, he could stand them after a while because they're not us. Yeah. They're like madmen. Like that's how we thought about them. Eventually, we just taught our children, uh, no matter if it was a genocide or not, but we taught our children to play and to. Uh, and you can tell at a certain period of time, between five, six, and seven, somewhere in that area, kids become aware of what they are. They become a person. Like it's just like a magical moment where before that they can't envision things as well. And then after that they're like, yeah, yeah, I can imagine myself riding a dinosaur. You know, like it's, yeah, right. you know, you know you, you, that's, a, that's a gift. That's a gift that we give her, gave ourselves the ability to imagine to such a degree. Well, um, in fact, Arguably, the reason that we're talking today is because of that gift, because it allows us to, you know, build what we have, you know, and to analyze our own thinking. But it's amazing we literally pulled ourselves out of that. But to, to imagine that these these people were living in that world. Um, so if I want to talk around the world w with the gods in the sky, I could, let's say, I never spoke your language. I could sail to an island where you live and you already have your stories about the gods. So I land and I go, I point up at the sky and go, what's that one up there? And you go, blah. And okay, now I go, blah. So now I call it, you call it Aries, I call it Mars. Okay. Uh, so now I already have a little bit of a tale that we know together, me and him, the guy I'm talking to. Because we both know the story of Mars, um, ourselves. Uh, so as the nuances between places you could walk to, the differences probably are not going to be incredibly great. Not it'd be a lot different, a lot less different than definitely if you already from, say, share India, a to, share a mythos or religion uh, or something. The Mayans, like that. They, you know, right? They, they would you would you would share sort of a common mythos between yeah. the, to, between the two. They may not you may get some of the details might might be different, but you all seen the same stuff happening. Exactly. It's so the, so the ability to communicate with people you've never seen before becomes 
a little, little lot, lot, lot easier. And these people were, like I said, literal. So they are scared of the gods, uh, uh, and uh, but they are obviously like people intermingling was a. Why would you be scared of that? You know, like uh, there's no reason to be fearing people of different colors when there are literally giant things in the sky, balls of fire, right. that will come down and blow this entire countryside to bits. You know, and that's just, I mean, right in the, the I mean, you know, he, you know, it's so true when you know that the story was told by, um, uh, I think it was uh, Seneca tells the tale of, or Cicero, I can't remember, Pliny, I'm not sure. Anyway, about the lightning bolt that destroyed the Etruscan city just north of Rome. It was a five-mile-wide lightning bolt that just took the city out. I think and there's a Pliny. crater there now. Yeah. So that's the story. And they're telling a story. And this is only 2,000 years ago. Uh, if you go look at uh, drawings of comets or paintings of comets from the 15th, 16th, and 1700s, you will see that they are much more elaborate than the comets that we see today and that's just a few hundred years so um it's quite possible that um things are getting calmer yeah it's, uh, it definitely well c compared to what you guys are talking about this is biblical level shit where where hand of finger fiery finger of god literally. comes in and just goes, yeah. <laughs> very city literally doesn't exist anymore literally. yeah and before it was before be, before the religious period when it was turned into uh a bureaucracy it was well yeah but it was it was it had a lot to do with power and then controlling the population because Monarchies are not very stable from generation to generation, <laughs> but religion is very stable. Uh, it changes only over uh, centuries, and so it was. Uh, it was a bold move, and it and it was definitely related to the movement, to, uh, the Messiah, the Messiah belief, which had its mm -hmm. origins in the Croesus uh, prophecy in in ancient ancient Egypt. But it was actually a worldwide thing to go. Uh, uh, to believe in a messiah and it probably had to do with the please planet. don't kill us anymore yeah it had to do with that it had to do with <laughs> planet mars it had to do with the father son thing it had to do with a world that was literally i mean in china you're talking 400 years of war um it was it was a tough time and so when we went into a, the, the religious period uh it was i guess the best engineered solution at that time but of course it over time has caused a greater and greater split in humanity and now we're super interconnected and so it's creating a new problem where people they're fighting over these motifs and archetypes but they don't actually themselves know what's behind those ar archetypes yeah. and we're and not a wise enough society at least in terms of traditional oh, sure. wisdom like yeah. in India where they know that that they're all related to the same set of gods but they have their 10,000 versions and they just don't kill each other over it but they they do know in India that that their various stories are just local uh, they're just local formations, but they all have it in the Vedas and in the Upanishads, which reflect the same battle of royal families as yeah, right. in in the Nordic cultures. But and they, they just don't fight and... each other over it. But in the rest of the world, <laughs> people have, you know, of course, vast different interpretations as to how these gods were behaving right. and, and the motifs that came from those. And then once you turn bureaucracy and you add politics and money, it creates a huge new, a huge new issue. That's been my, well, my, my, uh, since I sort of, I was raised, uh, you know, basically, I guess you'd call it Southern Baptist based on the geography where I was born. And that's kind of how it works, right? My you, you, God. You're always born. Somehow you're always born into the right religion, and it's the only one that's real. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but everybody has yeah, that same right. problem, right? <laughs> you know? But um, in, in stepping back and, you know, falling in love with some of the other ancient uh, texts and, and religions and things like that, it became very striking to me how. All of a sudden, when you when you take uh, more of a um, academic a, a approach to these, how so many of them are telling you sort of the exact same story over and over again, just with uh, different names of the character. It's like this, right? You guys call it archetypes, and 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 that's the right word for it, right? That's what these things really are. They're just these mm. repeated archetypes of power and struggle and morality and life and. Even like the Ten Commandments themselves, you know, you can find those in so many other places in ancient cultures that it's like, okay, well, all right. So what they're basically saying is 
Um, was this literally written by the fiery finger of God? Um, it sh- it's important enough that it should be at least. That's kind of what I'm. Well, it's kind of it's always that, been know? on the smartest and wisest of the, yeah. the few of the culture to kind of rein in the right. behaviors of the of the wider audience, and so that's basically what you have from Ashoka to Moses. I mean, right, right. They and, had to get everybody calmed and, down because they were. It was an era of hedonism. I mean, Dionysius was this ancient god and now he's come back and he's this god of partying (laughs) and (laughs) it is it is a dangerous thing when you when everybody i mean that that we had it in the third uh batman movie there the the uh, dark knight rises everybody kind of starts partying and just immediately starts trashing each other um it's it's a shame that that is one of the human behaviors but it is (laughs) one of the human behaviors so Uh, religion and politics provided one of those means, and of course, what did they do? They relied on something ancient. In the East especially, they, they relied on the king was not just divine, but he was, uh, he was also the source of fertility. So in some cultures, of course, if the fertility, well, that's if just the, that's fertility in agriculture did bad, he could lose his life, but in like, mm. Japan, that wasn't so. Um, but in, in Europe, uh, this divinity then became religious. Uh, a religious divinity, but we still have this belief in our culture today, as evidenced in the Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, that that a a physical king on the throne provides stability and calmness and plenty. Mm-hmm. And that's not a scientific belief. I mean, it is something certainly it's not emergent from nature, and there's no there's not really a great evidence historically for it. It's happened so rare. I mean, for every <laughs> Ashoka the Great, there's or or Genghis <laughs> Khan and look at both of those guys committed huge atrocities yeah. to, but get, to get to that place. So it that's does. not been a particularly great system, but people believe it uh, still to this day. I mean, when God Save the Queen is still a song played all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, harkens back to what we were talking about when the God was on his throne uh, above the North Pole. Things were cool. Yes. When he went away, it was totally not cool. Right. Because bad things, yeah. uh, weather mm-hmm. or cataclysmic weather events and things like that would start happening, right? It's kind of w- 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 so they they no, connected I mean, literally all literally the clash of the titans and uh ever and the 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 beautiful light that was there from the north constantly giving light to everything to the north and making it very lush, lush. to the northern hemisphere was gone gone and yeah. that lushness the Garden of Eden was over the Garden of Eden wasn't a place it was everywhere on the northern hemisphere because the light from uh, Saturn was green, well received by the plants, and the entirety of the northern hemisphere constant twenty four hours a day. Uh, the only place that wasn't getting the sun was right underneath the auroras uh, because they were quite thick and dusty. It's like so, snow built up. Uh, these glaciers built up, and then water would run off that as soon as the glacier pushed into the sunlight, the constant sunlight. And then uh, animals, uh, say, for example, um, woolly mammoths and so, would be eating those, uh, the food that's at the bottom of this, and this is where they would live. So when the water rebalanced, they're friggin' dead. The whole, everything was friggin' dead right around there. And then it all started going back to the north, where, where, where the, the debris of all the animal bones are found to the northern parts, because the water came down, killed everything, and then retreated pulling everything with it to giant islands of bones that we see uh in the northern part of siberia and so forth these is that's just and that's why we find them like that flash frozen yeah uh and and and, and gone because the, and the light's gone. gone we're talking about evidence by the way uh, if people go on academia and look for um you know flooding evidence of flooding uh, marduk 9557 bc we're talking hundreds to even thousands of meters of water. I mean, it is not a small amount of water. Now, that author, he ascribes it to a cometary impact, and there is some evidence of cometary impacts. But as we've gone over on this show and on uh, Neil's show, I just don't see that that is the right vector uh, to be talking about, considering not only the testimony but the megafauna extinctions themselves. And let's also bear in mind that at Gobekli Tepe, the Bosnian pyramids, and Ganung Padang, there's evidence that the people were so afraid that they had pissed off the god that they sealed the tunnels and buried the worship places and then Mm -hmm. moved on. 
they were it, it may be that it wasn't at that time a flood that ended Egypt uh, pre Egypt but that they were afraid that what they were doing was the cause and that they had displeased the God they had interesting relationships I mean in Sumeria there was at one point they were mad that Jupiter was not as good at sitting on the throne and so they would occasionally withhold offerings to Jupiter in order to chastise him to get back on the throne so that they could have a good <laughs> plenty uh, plenty in a harvest they thought that the the droughts or the floods were related to the movement of Jupiter now maybe they were i don't know but right. but uh, they thought that they had control over that by by changing uh, whether or not they gave <laughs> offerings that this is of course delusion um, but they didn't have any other solutions because it was a time in which we didn't carve our own destiny we have that ability now if we yes. get heads together but, uh, we, that was another thing that Julian James pointed out very, very nicely was the fact that you can tell our struggles as we attempted to try to divine future. He said, uh, in the very in the in the ancient Egyptians or what we what he called the ancient Egyptians in the seventies, uh, what we would call I don't know what we would call them but anyway those guys. Uh, he said the future to them the future was something you backed into. You could not see the future. You could only experience it when it happened. You couldn't predict the future. So divination became something that was important. Uh, and we had different methods for that. Omens became important. Uh, portents, supernatural. Uh, reading of tea leaves and bones. Uh, uh, then we started getting a system, the tarot card system, or, or playing cards themselves. Other things like that to try to allow us to make choices, we were really having struggles. We were having struggling with that, like, and and eventually we could start imagining That's the future. Yeah, uh, and that then we were nor then we were quote unquote ourselves. But the people who got there first, Plato uh, taught others, uh, uh, Confucius taught others, Siddhartha ta taught others, Lao Tzu taught others. They they were trying to do as 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 uh, Shifu was explaining the 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 nature of uh, of trying to uh, cajole these impulses and this of course leads directly to Plato's uh, cave allegory and the the noble lie and so forth and of course it, he was so well received uh, and his culture was so well received uh, with the the idea of the noble lie that uh, the hedonistic Romans said kill them all. So, yeah, it was heresy. Yeah, it was like all of a <laughs> sudden, just, oh, whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa, whoa! I like, I like your philosophy. Murder, 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 <laughs> murder, 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 murder. Right. <laughs> Again, though, it, uh, uh, something that gets repeated throughout history, right? When, especially when yeah. it comes to, but it, it's sort of like, because um, I believe in this whole concept that uh, DNA has a memory too, and I think that. Uh, come what may, you know, there is an evolutionary pathway there because if you are, if, you know, it, it, we didn't evolve evolutionary, like the concept of being a loner, a loner, someone that's a loner. It's like there's no such thing because those guys all got eaten. They're gone. That that DNA is gone. <laughs> like it's out of the, <laughs> you know, it's kind of out of the bloodline forever kind of thing. But um, and I think that there's this interesting thing, like you were hitting on that. So after they lost these physical representations to time it was they were gone these events everything like uh Shurfu was saying was everything kind of co starts calming down and and becoming way more stable on a more regular basis then then they then they sort of also lost their compass and then the advent of all of these other things were kind of starting to spring up to give people structure uh to what they used to just look to the sky to get right so now it's like what, okay so now what do i do and and they've 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 had this their entire lives generation after generation then one day oh, maybe it happened over the course of i don't know a couple hundred years but it's still like someone flipped the switch off and now what do you do so so they started to create um mechanisms to fulfill that kind of void that was left by these uh, uh celestial events that were no longer visible right it's actually very interesting that this is this is um this is pretty amazing. One of the things that I, if you ever watched the show called Rick and Morty, there's a part where <laughs> this giant, that. the giant heads come and go, show me what you got. And then they, uh, and then people, one, one of the school teachers, uh, prince, the principal decides to, uh, try to interpret for 
what the sky gods want. And it's really amazing because the sky god being there, even though it didn't do anything, carried a lot of weight with this preacher. Like, everyone started doing this. Like, they were willing to, uh, they were like, oh, no, we're going to send you the sky god. So what they did is anyone who was delinquent, they just tied up their 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 hands and feet and then uh, put a bunch of balloons uh, on them, uh, helium balloons, and then let them sail into the sky. <laughs> Go be with the gods. Bye. <laughs> you know, this is like, uh, well, you know we do this because we're just that stupid. You know, like, <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, um, I, I afraid, would say, afraid yeah. of surviving, you know, like it's, it's a defense mechanism in a way. There's that. There's also strong evidence for human self-domestication, and that could be the religious influence. Mm-hmm. It could be a natural state of civilization. Just any time you civilize, it might cause self-domestication, but certainly the it's well known. There's a whole video you can watch of people being subjected to kind of a hilarious experiment where they go into a doctor's office, and every once in a while, um, there's a ding, and then someone stands. Oh, I've seen that, yeah. And the next person comes in, and then they, they don't know why. They start standing, too, and pretty soon the whole room stands. Then you take out the original person, and then everybody that comes in from then on, they stand yep. at this ding. And they don't know and why. Nobody knows they don't why know they're why doing at all. They have no idea. They and did this with baboons or monkeys. Did, I remember. They did it with. They've done it with primates, and they've done it. But mm. humans will do this. It's oh a yes, well-known <laughs> problem. Um, and and obviously that is uh you know I was just I happened to be watching just before I came here to to do the talk with you guys. Um, there's a video I put it on my timeline of the, about the guy who didn't uh, Zeke Heil. You know the famous photo right, of the yep, man who yep. did Heil? Okay, so uh, you, when you watch that, the number of people that were Zeke Heiling and then marching and mm-hmm. going on, so few people questioned the grain. Uh, that, and it's, it's just very, very natural. And I would hearken that it does go back to our survival mechanisms, and of course it is really, really dangerous. And yeah, tribalism, and, yeah, yeah. And tribalism, yeah. It does yep. hit on a lot of those biological um, buttons that... <laughs> This is actually kind of funny because we were talking about this in, in intellectual circles with regards to scientists too, how they yes. will uh, yes. form yep. ranks oh and fight each other. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge problem uh, for humanity as a whole because, mm-hmm. and then here going back to what we were just talking about, what mankind did with themselves, we we know what we did with ourselves once once Mars came close to <laughs> the so world our and showed us his scarred <laughs> face and went into berserker mode. Mm-hmm. We've been stuck in the age of Aries throughout uh, the entire age of Pisces. We have Pretty been, much, yeah. We're, we're very warlike. We're very warlike, and the warrior, the, the, it's, it is true that, that, that men in particular, I can't speak for women because I'm not a woman, but I can speak for men. Men need a, a, a refinement path, a growth path, but that can happen in music, academics, writing. Men, they can... Well, it, it, it was talked about by Plato, process. literally, so yes, yeah. yeah. But the warrior path has been the one that's been held, quote, sacred, right? That's even one of the four top castes, one of the two top castes in India's history. And it was, that that of course, sense. Europe, I mean, jousting, um, you know, was the epitome by the time they had gotten to a place of technology and they had themselves perfectly armored up. All they could do was bludgeon each other from horses. I mean, they just didn't have... Um, you know, the same kind of vulnerabilities that, that were still present for the samurai who didn't have as great an armor. So they were still mostly fencing. But in, in Europe, they got they were like, gosh, we've got to get on these horses and hit each other with these sticks. It's mind-numbing. I still love the sport. I think it's amazing. But it's kind of amazing to think that some of the best, um, strongest, handsomest, most well-connected, affluent people were engaged in something that was essentially causing concussions and <laughs> brain damage, that will be yeah. genetic and and uh <laughs> i guess we're still doing that in our culture yep. but yeah uh the difference being we don't have we don't make engineers uh and doctors play football uh they can but we don't make them <laughs> right i do think that there is something to in in the the noble um to period of sciences in the 1800s most of those scientists did engage. Several of them were were famous for their boxing skills. Um, mm-hmm. I do think it's good for people to be physically. Well, remember engaged. the boxing. I'm, I'm not against that. I'm I'm a martial artist, so I'm not against that at all. I'm just saying that well, it as is. A martial artist, we you did know the difference. 
yeah. yeah, that's what we did with ourselves for those. When we had all that extra time and not everybody was always in temple, some religions were always in temple, but <laughs> most, of the, most of them were not. Um, war was the new the new way to pacify the gods, and literally for the Aztecs uh, and but, the, the Pawnee. Because Mars saved us from Venus, the dragon. Right. So we were still worshipping that event. Yes. Or so I think. Well, yeah, I think honoring it, or however you want to, however you want to say. I mean, for the Japanese, obviously, it it had to do with agriculture because there's so many uh, things about sumo that harken back to agriculture, and so their their interests seem to be uh, at least in the village because it didn't it didn't take off as far as the politics goes. It didn't take off till the um, middle shogunate, uh, but the the sport has its its origins all the way back in the Kofun period. Uh, when Mars, when those big Mars structures were being built, that show very cl- clearly the depiction of the Kali tongue of the, the the red dust coming down and covering the world, which mm. probably is probably where the band of desert around, uh, you know, from the Sahara and all that is right. probably where most of that sand came from. Um, but for the Japanese. That at that time the sumo was you know it was uh, a wholesome way to engage in wrestling and sport and you know the men they weren't super ro- round or anything they were just farmers. Right. Uh, eventually though the, it it became what it is today, um, and probably most of the people there they know that that the the sumo for example that they are supposed to be the embodiment of the gods. Right. Uh, the yokozuna are living gods on earth, just like the emperor. Uh, however, I don't think the average Japanese person really worships them that way or thinks that way. They no. they do have a, an interesting way of doing it, and and these these little fingerprints uh, of of ancient religion on modern culture, I think are really fascinating because they they have a subtle influence. I mean, it's obviously not the same influence as the iPhone or something, but <laughs> it is a strong influence that that shows up in <laughs> anime. It shows up in are the comic books and and mm-hmm. uh, things that we use to teach children, and that of course will pattern their behavior. We use the same story uh, like uh, over and over again, um, uh, and the motif is it's it's literally so strong it's in cinema, like you can't get rid of it. Exactly. I mean, it was. I mean, watching. I mean, I remember the change in our mindset. When Linda Hamilton was looking buff and you know badass in Terminator Two, right? Uh, and people were like, "What's going on, man?" And I'm thinking to myself, like, th- th- not back then, of course. Uh, but now that I look back on it, it's like, no, that was the that's the rejection of allowing Venus to have weapons again. Last time Venus got control, she just practically destroyed the world. You don't let women have power and that's like a a thing like violence like it's a thing that is almost universal it's like an I evolutionary yeah, yeah. evolutionary Venus archetype. was very scary to us yeah and her long flowing hair turned into a dragon and tried to burn yeah. civilizations and mars showed up and started taking the hits for us and uh that you know thank you for saving us and that motif of uh, literally, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, or or Cinderella, the same story. Uh, it, there's a dragon. Uh, uh, you know, Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, same story. Link, same story. It's all the repeat of a repeat of a repeat of a repeat. So. And it still resonates. There's a, there is a, a weird sort of um, what would you call this? Like an evolutionary bias towards certain archetypes within our. I mean, it's ingrained. It, we just keep it, going they, back to them actually, over and over again. They're called memes. They're li- that's literally what they are. Uh, the me- what we call memes are actually yeah. not really memes. But yeah, yeah, the original memes. Yeah, that's, that's something that's unconscious. We can't even understand. Like like shaking hands, uh, yeah. nodding your head yes, the crossing of the fingers, um, like we were talking about. Um, uh, why did we do this? What what we were what we were trying to to emulate, uh, and the and they harken back. Uh, very strong, especially if you even going looking at old pictures, just a few years ago, like bedposts have balls on them. Why? Why are there circles 
at the at the uh, like those those balls are at the end of stairways too. Like they were balls at the end of st- on the end of stair- stairwells, like yeah, the, and, the railings. Why? And and on the off chance that somebody, <laughs> it's on the off chance that somebody listening thinks that it it's totally crazy and that we're imagining these shapes or something. Go yourself and look for. Uh, look first. Learn what these archetypes are. What their shapes. Their Why are there shapes two pillars are. on either side of doorways all the right. time? Right, and then it, and then go and look for the evidence. You know, with me, I looked in the Rock Art of Kentucky book, uh, but there are all these these. There's hieroglyphics that don't make any sense. Uh, many people have seen the the boat going over Nut at night, and and it has been long interpreted uh, by Egyptology that Nut is the, the, uh, Milky Way and, and represents the, the night sky and that the boat is Ra, the sun having to travel underneath the earth to get back around, which doesn't make, to me, make any sense because here it's going above, but there is actually a hieroglyph of the boat being upside down and traveling across the sky and no ship sails upside down. So what were they really trying to convey? If people go and look, they will see these. Yeah, of course they make sense. Like you take the yin yang, it it makes sense. Like when you look at it, you go, "Wow, this Taiji two, this is, this perfectly describes the complementary aspects of yin and yang." Mm-hmm. But there is also a plasma formation that generates this, and it perfectly describes the vortex activity. And as I've mentioned before, I don't know if it was on your show or not, Matt. Um, vortexes are not described by the Coriolis effect like like flushing toilets uh, because there are also anticyclones that flow in the opposite direction. Uh, so vortices in both north and southern hemisphere, their rotations are determined by the direction of flow of the Birkeland currents. That is, what's, that is what is actually causing them to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. But we conveniently ignore the anticyclone direction because it's easier to just explain it with the Coriolis effect. But that's, mm. not, that's not reality. It's sort of like blaming the holding up of clouds on wind. But ha- what wind have you ever felt is exactly going to create a flat surface all the way across? And you could look for the next 100 miles, every cloud is it's as if it's sitting on a piece of glass. That is not going to be something that wind does because wind is chaotic in its, in its general motion and it has concentrations and dilutions. So it is only charge that is able to, to create that exact effect. Okay, it can't be magnetism, of course, because water is not magnetic, it's, it, but it is a polar molecule. Yeah. So how do, we, how do we find the proof? And it may sound like we're, we're, we're corkboarding with yarn over here, but it's really not. It, it, if you go and you look at the evidence, uh, whether you read my papers, you go to the Thunderbolts Project, or you, you come to the Electric View, um, and you, you will see that things start to string together in a way, and they will be disparate sciences and disparate religions and disparate ideas that heretofore you did not imagine they had any connection at all. And that is the whole point of Occam's Razor. If you can bring everything together in a simplistic explanation, that is a better science. What's and a, then it starts making predictions. And the predictions are a lot more, they're even more fun than learning all the stuff that, that has already happened. It's a ball mm. to really kind of listen to you guys because that's sort of the other thing is I don't know that I've ever found a theory that was so much, so inclusive of so many disparate, different um, types of uh, uh, professions or whatever you want, disciplines, okay? Where you can look back and you can say, well, there's a hook here, there's a hook here, there's a hook here, across multiple disciplines that sort of stitches all of this stuff together. And, and now everybody's still saying this, that, that, that this is the, like the electric universe theory, right? And that it bears further discussion and investigation. That's kind of what everyone's saying here, right? They just want to, oh. they just, and look, there's oh, all yeah, this they, physical there are multiple evidence. streams of it that, that they don't agree with each other. I mean, I was just mentioning earlier, you know. Uh, I try to keep them all in my head. Yeah, you try to keep them all because you've got, there's people that are big on uh, including Jupiter, and there's people who don't want to include Jupiter, and then there's people who don't want to include the mythic history, and they only want to talk about the, the relevant plasma science. Um, and then there's people who don't throw out the Big Bang and don't don't throw out black holes. There's people who are willing to call them black holes even though they're not black holes. There's a those whole are very planet. silly people. Those are, maybe so. <laughs> However, we're open enough to say, okay, that's what everybody's been calling them. How convenient that is. It's sort of like Ben Franklin, 
he got positive and negative backwards. Oh, yeah. with it, you know right. what I mean? Uh, it's just there, the way that we have to go. There are different degrees. Like the the SO crowd tends to be a little bit uh, more into the conventional. But if you're going into, um, like, for example, Dr. John Scott and the Thunderbolts Project, you're going to get a lot from the point of view of electrical engineering. And uh, once you study electrical engineering, uh, for example, he was talking about the cloud layer. Just to give you an example of things that you would never understand initially, just for your audience. So there's a charge difference between the ground and that cloud layer. That cloud layer has an area, and the ground has an area. If there is charge of a certain amount on one plate, which is the ground in one case, there will be an equal and opposite charge on the other plate, the cloud layer. The cool thing is, though, is that there's a separated distance between these two quote-unquote plates. Let's say, in this case, I'll pick 10 kilometers just at random. Probably not even that. Let's just go uh, one. Canadians one in your kilometer. kilometers. Okay. So, What's that we mile? say the difference what? between these two points is, let's say, uh, in voltage, yeah. uh, maybe, say, <laughs> 100,000 volts. It's probably not, but let's just say that because it makes math easy. All right. So we have a certain area. We have so much charge on each plate. We have the distance between the plates. And, of course, we have the... Um, the... Uh, the... Uh, like I said, voltage there. So once you have all that calculated, then I know what the, quote, C or capacitance of those two connections are. If I change one, for example, if I move the cloud layer closer to the Earth, like let's just push it down to 500 meters, that changes everything in the equation instantly. It's, not, it's an if-then statement. So now the Q is much higher because it has to be, because these things are much closer together, because right. it has to be, because that's what the formula says. And there's nothing you can do about that. So this is, these are the formulas that allow us to build the computers we're looking on here. And that right there is just talking about one cloud layer. You can do that to the entire planet and realize that the ionosphere is a quote-unquote movable plate. The Earth represents the other plate. The area is the size of the Earth. Okay, It's not perfect. It's not perfectly even. But because there's also flowing charge in there, but on, in general, that means that there is a charge, there's a voltage difference of 500,000 volts, there's a difference of 50 kilometers, that means that there is so much Q, there is so much C, coulombs and charge and all that stuff. So, of course, when something is barfed out of the sun and comes towards this thing like a ball of plasma, that charge is now affecting this system, and it begins to cause the plates to contract. Now, that is exactly what happened during the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, the ionosphere retracted 30 kilometers. So it went from 50 to 20. And now the argument is, was it attracted because of the earthquake or was the, the earthquake motion because of the, uh, yeah, refracting right. to the plasma? So this means that this can, because of course, once you push these two things together, now you created a polarity, you're going to have the right-hand rule in effect, and you're going to create a voltage potential between two points underground, which is, you know, like underground lightning and Zorch, and that is probably where your tsunami came from. But here you're looking at this thing, and these are if-then statements, like I said. They're not something you can, they're not mutable. They're as, they're as immutable as the law of gravity, so to speak. They are just as finite, and we use them for building everything we possibly use today. So to ignore that and to say, no, no, even though we know it's not electrically neutral, we just pretend it is for the purposes of our science of astrophysics. Right. Or if at least someone said that to me, that they ignore the rules of electromagnetism because it's... Uh, well, I can't even imagine what you do with that. Why would you do? Why would you ignore that? <laughs> well, it's, it's been convenient because we are the the not even fleas. We're the microbes on the the glass plate, uh, you know. And it's convenient to say it's all relatively zero. But in the room around people listening, the charges are not actually zero. It's it's there is a difference between different parts of the room, different parts of the home, going outside. Um, the weather is changing every day, and it's bringing uh, the changes. So what the Chinese describe as the changes, it's happening all around you all the time. 
And for the softer part of the audience that doesn't understand what we're talking about when we say capacitance and charge, just think of it this way. When you hold those two magnets and you feel a repulsion between those, that itself to the ancients, if they had held those same, these well-designed magnets that we've created using these laws um, that, that would not have been just you know, found on the ground, right? Uh, if they had held those a couple thousand years ago, they'd say, oh, yep, that's the, that's the, uh, the word of the God. You know, right. that, that's it right there in your hand. It's, that is your ether. We, we found it uh, for the most part. We're just, uh, for some reason, we're stuck on needing to look for more of it. And we've already harnessed this power to a degree, but there are aspects of its of the force and of its movement that we have experimented with in lab and seen really interesting things and go, wow, that's really weird, but we haven't put it to application yet. And that and is the thing that we are capable of doing. It's just uh, as well we as get behind it. As well know? as we understand uh, electricity to the point where we can build amazing computers and logic devices and, and motors and servo motors and all these amazing things, and they're all repeatable. You know, there are still things about electricity, though, that don't make any sense. And, and oh, yeah. A lot yeah, of people I don't have, know I have that. some puzzle videos. Probably a lot less than you think because there's a lot of misinformation out there. But I recognize that there are some things where I go, huh. huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, think, I think that there's probably even things that are still hidden. I mean, even, even something like superconductivity I don't think is properly understood. Um, well, I think that there are probably a whole flip side of it that, that we don't yet understand only on account of we we haven't really uh, seen it all. I mean, Bose-Einstein condensates, which are probably ultra cold plasmas, mm -hmm. uh, that's super mysterious. And and crystal plasmas, these things are definitely weird. Um, as a, as an interesting point, when you were mentioning about what this would have been like living in some of these places, uh, you just bring to mind when you were talking about these ultra cold plasmas and stuff. Um, I'm reminded that um, if we all go go into the quote unquote paranormal. Uh, which, uh, again, not necessarily a big believer here, but um, you talk about orbs, you talk about using salt, an electrically neutral thing to separate two things, which we do today. We use salt to uh, uh, separate uh, different metals in batteries and so forth. Um, uh, the sulfur idea of it, um, the vi fact that we use EKG meters, uh, you know, electrical... Electricity is what we're detecting, and that's what we're looking for. We want to search for "quote unquote" ghosts, but to move further in the past, there are stories about how these people dealt with these issues. For example, um, there are, there are stories of what we call elves and fairies today, where the are these things coming out of the tops of uh, thunderstorms and stuff, reaching into space. Well, they were named after elves and fairies. Were, for example, in in Iceland. Uh, blue elves and red fairies would dance across the volcanic rocks. Uh, at certain, like they've said that they just did that. They just danced across the rocks. They weren't on fire, they, they, but but this this was a extremely conductive material because lava is extremely conductive. Um, and so here it is, this popping up through the island, and you get these little little things, with, especially when the northern lights are going. So it's like resonating with that. So this is what they were talking about in Scandinavia. Uh, they talk about will-o'-wisps, which are what well, I would, for lack of a better term, call a plasmoid or ball lightning doing its thing, going through the through the through the forest, like a light going through the forest. To defend yourself against these creatures, uh, you would have to hit uh, the will-o'-wisp with cold iron. Um, if you hit it with cold iron or just wrought iron, it will disrupt and disperse the will-o'-wisp, you'll kill it. This is from only the 1400s, and they're talking about this stuff like it's a real thing to them. And they, they had to fight these lights off in forests with pieces of metal, which, of course, would immediately short out if there was a, a, yeah. a thing across it. You would just short that right out. It, go, pow, gone. And there's cross-cultural proof that that's the same in Chinese... Uh, that was big stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah and and it is uh, a literal effect. Of course, Matt, you've had um, Madam Catherine on your show, and yep. she has a video uh, 
of which I was in the room but didn't see it, but we had the camera on low light detection and an orb oh. went right by and it physically lifted her hair. It's creepy. Uh, and yet went through it. It's very creepy. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. And it's a but plasmoid. Would, it's, it's clearly... It's clearly a plasmoid. There's well, no it should lift your hair, is what I meant. Exactly. Like, yeah. It it should. Exactly. If it's if it's an area of charge passing through the atmosphere, <clears throat> your body, especially if connected to the ground, your hair is just a a whole whack of really fine um, ends. And as you know, electricity likes to gather on the ends of things, like the yeah. uh, the edges. Yeah. That's why it tries to round things off. Uh, as it etches, uh, which you can see on 67P uh, on pretty much all across Mars, for example, and across the Earth in uh, certain places. Of course. And, and what's really great is this one's clearly following a Birkeland flow because it's moving in a corkscrew or helical fashion uh, mm. as it goes up and, and by. And uh, it's, wow. it's really fantastic. Of course, in, in the clinic, clinically, the plasma orbs, when they rarely do show up, um, again, you usually have to have a low light condition and, and uh, you'll only see very briefly a, a, a flash of light. Almost always is, is associated with the ejection of energy. The person feels something leave the body. And the question is, what is that? Um, and if if we follow my hypothesis of the, that meridians are charge distributive networks, it is the uh, charge that had accumulated in their body, which was disrupting their normal physiology, and now is being excreted um, uh, through repelling, repelling it, and is forming its own little accumulation. And there, I mean, traditionally, ancient, in every culture around the world, they have this understanding. And of course, in China, they had a really funny one when a when a uh, serial killer or a major criminal thief or something died in the village. And they went, or, or they were hanging them. It was the doctor's job to go and take a ceramic jar, which of course is going to be an insulator, and to actually catch the Poe of the criminal as it fell out of the anus. And then cap it and then put a, a uh, what's called a foo or talisman on the jar to seal it. And then they would bury it. So that it couldn't get out. So they would literally ground it. Wow. Right. So the, very the, fascinating the final... stuff. And there's a video of um, a man called DJ. That's not his real name, obviously, because he's Chinese. And there's a video of him uh, lighting up uh, an LED using the body, the energy in the body. And I, I uh, it, that... it, it definitely confounded a lot of people, but... Um, uh, they were Western uh, scientists and, and journalists, and they were there to, to film him. Um, but if, as far as the Chinese are concerned, he's actually kind of a low-level guy. <laughs> well, I would need a lot more to... Uh, Substantiate, like, yeah. yeah. To, well, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, creating a voltage potential across yeah. the body is actually not something that would blow my mind necessarily. But I, to make... I, I would basically go, okay, well, let's really figure out what is required to light the LED. Well, that's yeah. the, and that's you know, it. Did and you then, all see, and yeah. then did you all, see if the body could do that. Did you all ever see uh, Stan Lee's Superhumans? Yes. Uh, there, I did, there's, I a Rus- there's a Ru- there's a Russian on there who can magnetize his body at will. And then, um, and they, they, they prove it's not stickiness. It's right. uh, it's actual. Magnetism. Yeah, and then there was another guy who could take massive amounts of voltage without dying. It was... Uh, Really? So, oh, it was just unbelievable. That that whole show has, of course, some of the most interesting people. <laughs> um, the the explanation for super strength was uh, really quite fascinating because it just had to do with the rapid firing of muscles, uh, and the because yeah. it forces mass times acceleration, the man's muscles were accelerating faster, and hence he was able to to bend steel and do all sorts yeah. of interesting things. Uh- I told uh, you pull, this. Pull up cars and interrupt their uh, their forward momentum uh, because his muscles were accelerating very very quickly. I, I really like that show because they they tried to stay very scientific with all the explanations. Stanley Superhumans. Yeah, that's uh, that was on. Uh, it was like uh, I think you can stream it now. But uh, and, and I think sure, you, you and I have talked that. about this too. That all paranormal means is shit. We just ain't necessarily figured out how to measure yet. Pretty much. I mean, uh, Ball Lightning that, was paranormal until they finally photographed it. Yeah, and, and that's that's and right. I mean, now the sprites, the sprites up in the the sky, the the uh, 
Yeah, elves and the el, yeah, the yeah. Elo events. So all of that was quote paranormal until they finally. So now UFOs have gone mainstream. I mean, you've got government officials going on the news saying we don't know what they are. It's not us. And uh, of course, there's the <laughs> classified right. footage. They're not saying it's aliens. They just say we don't know what it is. Here's the footage, and, uh, Make and what the media is going, yeah, yeah, we don't know what it is either. Well, one of the one of the things I, I, I the only one of the things I really like about UFOs is when you get them on radar. It's like okay, so they don't have radar technology here. But plasma, of course, as many would know, is literally metal when it comes to radar. Like uh, it is as reflective as metal is. If you created a coma around something, you might as well it might as well just be coated in aluminum foil to a radar. Um, and that's why some of those those things that we are used to look underground when we're looking for things and they see, oh yeah, there's a chunk of metal there and then they go dig and they don't find it. They don't know why. <laughs> yeah, and plus think about when they try to approach them, it always ends up shooting away very yes. fast. Mm-hmm. Because of the the again the repulsion the electrostatic repulsion. So well, you're flying towards sort of, you're flying towards this thing, okay, in a plane, which is to 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 a piece of charge potential, is a long string, okay, moving between charge layers, which is your tail of your of your jet, which is a plasma, reaching into different charge layers, and you're like a metal probe trying to get towards it. Yeah. Of course, you're going to be different charge virtually guaranteed than the object you're getting towards because that plasma is a different charge than the layers you are connected to through your tail of your of your jet so you're okay. never going to catch it and it's going people, to move away from you like every time if people are wondering you know is this a real effect there was actually an incident i forget which uh mission and probe it was maybe it was rosetta where where we actually approached this comet, and there was a bright flash before we landed. NASA was busy scratching their head, and and Walt Thornhill had already predicted such a thing might happen if you rapidly approach one of these charged comets, and your probe is at a different charge level. You could have a flashbang. Uh, which probe was that? Sixty-seven P was that? Was that no, the comet we were going to? No, Comet Temple One. Temple One, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was a pre-flash, which was enormous. If you watch the actual footage of the impactor as it went in, uh, it, he was, you're right, it saturated the, uh, the sensors because they thought it was going to be a little puff, but it turned out to be a gigantic nuclear explosion uh, with, with no nuclear devices there, which is a <laughs> piece of copper that was being sent towards it. But uh, if you look at the footage, you can see how in the last few frames, the whole uh, impactor completely twists to the right and then looks off to the side before it explodes. So uh, it got the right-hand rule came into effect prior to impact. There's no reason for that to have changed aiming if it was something else. But, right. you know, if it's electricity, it's going to twist you as the charge comes up because you're a piece of metal, you know, so. So it had and, a physical... And, it had a physical... Lenz's law says... <laughs> yeah. And see, these are the kinds of things, guys, that, that we, there's there's so many of these topics. We need our own <laughs> yeah. thing to get people together and, and go over yeah. these topics to get them. And I think it's our time. I know that, you know, back in the 90s, the conference game was kind of a hard way to make money because, you know, how do you get your word out? But the Internet, it's a totally different yeah, place. Right. I was watching um, the Late Night Wars <laughs> And somebody made the comment below that one of the best things that ever happened to Conan O'Brien was not making the Tiny Night Show anymore right. because now he's on YouTube and he gets way more uh, yep. action on YouTube than he than he does uh, than he would on uh, the NBC. And the internet has totally changed how people are absorbing information and learning. And it is important, especially if we're going to help people get out of uh, various cults like the global warming cult, right? If, if people really want to understand human history, archaeology, um, and I try the, not to, technology. I try hard not to blame them, though. Uh, well, we can't blame them because they've been Just, taught one thing. It's like when I went to college, yeah, I heard of plasma, but we didn't have any classes on it. Nobody, nobody told us that there were problems with Faraday. This wasn't a thing that, you know, it was just you just gloss over it and you move on. And <clears throat> when you are... 
born into that, even if you are the most well-intentioned, you know, and, and for me personally, I was the kid who watched nonstop Discovery Channel back when it was actually a science channel. Right. <laughs> and so it was not my intention to come out, um, you know, I was mainstreamed. And, I was as well. And yet, here we are, um, it, is, it is becoming apparent. It's not only Clovis first that has failed, it is almost every scientific paradigm I can think of is coming. I mean, got my gosh, just the other day they discovered there's, there's more letters to the DNA. So mm-hmm. there are so many things, and there's, a, there's the ways that the brain is transferring information that isn't synaptic. Um, there's all these new things that are coming up, and people, I think if we're to positively distract them rather than them only being invested in entertainment and, and uh, social media junk, is to give them something that will uh, nourish their life in a new direction. And even if... And in other they, ways, yes. Yeah. yeah, even if they if they stay religious, it could empower them, right? Even if they stay Southern Baptist or if they stay Pentecostal or something like that, they can come away and go, wow, so this yeah. has a concrete thing. I feel empowered now because Noah's flood is not is not bunk. Right, this is something that sixty, at least sixty some cultures, if not thousands of cultures, witnessed. And what was it? And how did it work? And what is the science behind it? They can, of course, make their own mind up as to, you know, what's the magic behind it. Right. But <clears throat> don't it care. is something that can be unifying. Is I, the point. I and the technology that... then has a, I guess, like a core <laughs> axis. I tell, yeah. I tell people that I don't care how you get there, just get there. <laughs> that's the big thing is just get there yeah right? whatever vehicle yeah. you ride in whatever i don't get not a that shit. we're not that we're the final arbiters and that we've oh, gotten yeah, there no way it's no, continual no. evolution for for us i mean we're always introducing new ideas to each other and and uh challenging each other and uh you know there's people like on electric view for example neil constantly has physicists on there and they don't just accept whatever they see new, right? They even with new mainstream science, they yeah. they're 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 always questioning that or trying to hold different ideas uh, in play and really think about them. From we an have a ter- we have a, we have a term for that when uh, when like for example one of the shows that you're gonna you're gonna see, uh, I said well, I said and curling in energy or curling photography, of course, uh, no one can deny that. And uh, then he goes, actually, and he goes and t- shows me how uh, uh, someone proved that it was just uh, that was just oxygen being filmed as it escaped the body. And um, we call that when someone trumps you like that right in the middle of your speech when you're making a point with it. Uh, I did that with them before during that commercial for the Nokia, which had Bruce Lee playing uh, playing a ping pong. Right, right. Well, that's not a real thing, right? They right, were like, "Oh, this not. is all real. This is a." Pi-. And of course, and at the end of it, I yeah. was like, "I went in one of the videos. I went and said, I said, uh, I said, no, no, it, it was filmed by Nokia for 2008 for blah 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 blah, and it's a real like actor, and it's all the ball was added digitally, and it goes, and then I think it was, um, I think it was Eugene who said, "That's a." That's a Bruce Lee nun chucking right there. <laughs> and so now that's what we use it. Like, whenever you walk over, because he, then Buddy comes over and uses it against me. I goes, actually, that was all discredited. And then, then Eugene goes, Bruce Lee nun chuck. Yeah. <laughs> right off. Because my, my trade of thought's gone now. Like, yeah. you just completely destroyed me in my point. And now I'm sitting here with nothing to say. Well, that's something. And <laughs> well you know, done. You, and you have that like, regular. Unfortunately, every time you guys call me, I'm, I'm standing in a plant someplace. <laughs> and you have that <laughs> conference call. But th- that's something that. You know, this is all open for debate here. These are people that are wanting you. You guys yeah. are, have different viewpoints on this subject. However, we just oh, did yeah. two solid hours of what you kind of already agree on. You know, so uh, this is phenomenal being able to have these kind of conversations about these other uh, more esoteric topics and things like that outside of uh, accepted academia is how these things get formulated and yeah. they get beat up. I mean, that's what you're kind of saying is it's we're, not we're like... open to, for example, for the extended plasma electromagnetic cosmology, I've designed it to be both open source and I want people to write and attack because the more that we attack, this is the original idea of science in the first place. Mm-hmm. The more we attack it, the, the quicker we get to an answer. If people 
just worship Volta, we don't get to the next stage, which is or you know, Einstein, Maxwell, right? Same right. same issue. Um, it was only because people didn't think the previous models of electricity were correct that by the end of that century we were able to have alternating current, and that wasn't meant to stop there. Um, we did that show already, but um, it was meant to continue. Right. And and it is it has been a little bit kind of I mean there's been plasma research for the last hundred plus years, but um, it has been mostly uh, relegated to very academic circles. Uh, and you know there's all sorts of things though that are like that. I mean we've known for a while how geckos can hang from the ceiling. And yet, you just don't see a lot of products working on <laughs> Van der Waals horses. Right. right? They're so mostly suction cups. Yeah. Uh, it's just the tendency of mankind to yeah. kind of well, lag look, behind it's, in, in application. Plasma is about to have its day, folks, in, <clears throat> a, big, in a great so. big way because as these, I mean, that's basically how these fusion reactors are working is, is inside plasma. It's a plasma field that they're creating. And with these big electromagnets and things like that, so it's 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 about to have its day. It's finally going to have its say, and and, and I think it, with the way it's going, China's going to be the ones that turn it on first, and then and they're going to well, take a quantum it's actually leap. always been, um, you know, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Russia, and if if that continues, yes, China, because they're. There, there's an essence to this of science is literally as you were describing. If we keep pounding on it. Uh, we can only prove science. We can only prove things false. You can never prove, prove things true. So it's like you're, you're basically taking a knife and going, "It's true." You're stabbing a block of rock, right? It's true. 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 Now, if you manage to hit it in a certain spot right over here, and you get under the thing and it cracks open, then you can go, "It's false here," and then you have to find out why it's false there, and right. then build a new theory, and then continue on. Now that is the essence of science. Yes. That is not science as we depict it in school. And it's not science right. as depicted by astrophysicists. They yeah. go and say, here's the beginning of the universe. Here's a bunch of things with dinosaurs. Here's a bunch of other things here. And now we're to today. Uh, that, and, the, and, the, and the tale of that skips over so much as to Contact, why something's falsified. Yep, and, yep. and when it gets falsified, do we pretend it's not falsified? And that happens all the time now Ooh, with astrophysicists. Yes. You're like, this is not, uh, it, this, this shouldn't happen. This, this star just changed color, for example. Yeah. Oh, well, we just, um, we, um, we, do, we ignore that. Or as, uh, as Robitaille found with that uh, thing, they went out and set up the CMB thing. Yeah, the cosmic microwave. You can tell them about that. They extended the cosmic microwave background, and lo and behold, well, they didn't get the answer they expected. So what do they do? I don't. I don't recall any satellite. Do you recall any satellite? Yeah. I don't recall a satellite. Probably some some episode we'll have to do. We'll pull up <laughs> my my dark matter papers, and we'll go through the the falsifications because I'm keeping track now. It's it's classical black hole theory, and it's accretion theory, and it's it's a number of scientific hypotheses common that, descent they've been treated, and i'm not even i'm not even biblical but i still have a problem with common descent they, they've they've <laughs> they've treated these things as if they are uh laws yes and and that is a huge mistake because they've always especially been, when they put newton universal himself, in front of it newton himself said gravity was a theory and that he didn't know how it worked and that it would probably be disproven and einstein also said that that probably uh, general relativity would be disproven at some point. I'm pretty sure um, it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's basically we're at the stage where um, there's going to be a merger, and it's uh, plasma physics is is already being mixed in terms of uh, uh, relativity. They're using relativistic plasma physics now, and they're starting to mix magnetohydrodynamics with uh, quantum electrodynamics. So. There's going to be a merger at some point, and strong, the strong force will be found to be also electro. So you'll have the electro weak will combine with the, the strong force. But what's holding it back is, uh, I think at this point, the cork in, in the bottle is the redshift. Because that's the thing that, that they must rely on. And because it goes back to 1848, um, this belief that 
uh, all redshift is a Doppler phenomena. Right. And uh, they hold on to that most dear, and after that would be the gaseous sun. Um, Which is also... Ancient yeah. and, and archaic and, and out of date. But both and, of them required something that is understandable. Okay. Yeah. It, you just, have to basically say, hey, Newton, Newton's <clears throat> law of gravity doesn't apply universally. Now, you say that, and you might as well just throw everything you have and walk home because you're done. No one's going to hire you ever yeah. again. Yeah. The next one is, uh, as you said, um, uh, what was the first thing you were saying there? It was something else. Doppler, 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 Doppler effect. Yeah. To, to put that into context, to try to understand uh, what redshift can be if it is not Doppler, was uh, something that's... I mean, only recently, I probably within the last 20 years. 20 years, yeah, really. We figured out that you can actually change uh, the redshift of a gas by changing the properties of the voltage and current across the, you know, yeah. like that basically changing the properties of plasma. That's not something that's intrinsic. It, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, plasma physicists have been working on stuff for 60 years tops, you know, like, and astrophysicists have been working on things for uh, 500 years. <laughs> so, how far so, back do you want to go? Uh, right. Yeah. Really hard to compete. You know, you're not. They're not. Uh, and of course, when you say, "Oh, that pulsar, that's just a relaxation oscillator between two plasma fields that are uneven," not unlike you would get within a BJT across the blah 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 blah. And he's they've already glossed over it because they have no idea what you're talking about. But uh, someone who's trained in that, like myself, goes. Yeah, like that's yes. There's that's what yes. <laughs> that's yeah. how we used. Um, that's how we made vacuum tube amplifiers way back in the day for music. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, oh, right. that's what it is. The field vibrates. It creates a thing that allows and, you to to control the current flow much more directly just by altering yeah. the voltage very slightly. It's and that of, is what happens on the pulsar. I think. It, in other words, to to the again the layman, softer, the, yeah, the layman sorry. of the audience, if the ether <laughs> is the the force and these charges, then electrical engineers have been wizards, and we've been you know wizard we've been the the wizards for the last hundred and some years, <laughs> and um, all the, the chemical engineering and other types of engineering they're relying on these effects. Of course, we can treat them mechanistically in many cases. We can use kinetics and statics, of course, yeah. But but of at the fundamental level, at the physics, at the atomic level, we're talking everything is really related to this one single force. And that is, a, that is still, you can have a spiritual experience. The Star Wars, the, the whole movement where several people became Jedi, they felt so connected to that. That was partially the cathartic experience of the warrior path combined with seeing the morning star blown up. But it is also a real experience a person can have. They can really... Uh, feel the the energy if they really go through the training and have that experience. But you can have it by getting a job in engineering or just learning more, applying it in your home, um, learning more about alternative energies because it isn't only solar. Um, the photovolt photovoltaics is our first foray into that. Uh, we we have better we have better things that we can do. Um, and, and even optical and quantum computers aren't the end. We've got biocomputers, and there's all yeah. sorts of things that there's are coming. There's a lot happening, um, yeah. It, the more people get interested in it and in that kind of, of thing, and, and I'm not knocking astrologists. I'm not knocking um, people who want to get into that, and they feel very, we call them crunchy people or woo people. Um, I myself am in the field of acupuncture, but what I am saying is that you can have a more concrete experience with that, and the two can come together. Yeah, there's a convergence, for sure. The cosmology, yeah. through a shift in cosmology. Yeah. Because, you know, there was a time where a lot of people in the woo field, we were, we were like, oh, dark energy and dark matter, that must be heaven, and that must be all the stuff that we can't find, and ha-ha, here it is. <laughs> that is not acceptable after 2015. No, no longer, right. No. We've got to get uh, realistic, and, and actually it's better because the more concrete and yeah. practical that we get, the more we're going to help the planet. We're, we're going to help by getting away from what Tesla said is the most barbaric way of generating energy, which is to burn things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
All right, guys, that's we've been at this for two hours, great. 15 minutes. Let's do this. Um, I think there should definitely be another one of these. <laughs> uh, <laughs> point, well, we, we can go forever. I mean, yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is stuff we don't it doesn't. Get, even though I have a podcast, I still don't get to talk about it enough. Uh, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't end. Well, let's that's, talk. Uh, let's do this. Uh, all right. So, uh, Sherfu, tell people where they can find you uh, if they want to reach out to you directly. Uh, well, they can certainly write to me at Ramon, with no E, R-A-M-O-N, at bluelotushealth.com, or they can uh, read my papers at uky.academia.edu slash Shifu Cariaga. That's S-H-I-F-U-C-A-R-E-A-G-A. Um, or reach out to the Electric View group um, and, uh, you know, join the Electric View channel on YouTube. and We even have a Discord, too. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's a Discord. There's... We're we're all really connected. We're just willing to, <laughs> to share all this and, and no charge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Neil. So where can where can folks find you if they want to reach out to you and want to look up your stuff? Well, you can find me at uh, obviously I have a few things on the Thunderbolts uh, uh, project, a uh, few papers there. Obviously, you can get me on the uh, the Facebooks with the Electric View uh, Electric View community, the Electric Universe Theory Group, the Thunderbolts Project Group, all of those electric geology, all of that stuff, and uh, of course, uh, electric the Electric View at YouTube uh, or on YouTube, you can find us there. And uh, we've been uh, talking about this subject for well now not uh, nine months doing podcasts uh, similar to this uh, from different points of view, trying to. Uh, wrap her head around uh, what we're looking at yeah so. sure he well, has a talk on he has also a an eu conference talk was it 2012 or 14 me neil yeah i had a t- I, I i did a talk in uh on uh, 2017 2017 mm-hmm. yeah and, and I, I, was, I, I was also the mc on the on the thing there for sunday so i definitely recommend people to watch neil uh, uh talk on stage it's a great it's a great talk well, that's cool. Yeah, and and, and and that's available, I think, on YouTube, right, Neil? Like, people can actually go and view and watch that, or it's available on the Electric Universe site somewhere um, that well, got recorded, we'll fa- right? Well, we're actually going to do a special of it as well, so uh, I'm going to try to make one for... Uh, we're, we're doing some um, presentation-like uh, like things, like we did for one of our, our friends trying to make uh, a great... Uh, something uh, a little bit more polished, a little bit professional, so that they can see, uh, like, a... Like a, a PowerPoint presentation oh, okay. while we talk type sure. of thing. So, yeah. M- multimedia. Find those things. <laughs> yeah. Multimedia, exactly. All right. Well, good enough, guys. I appreciate the time. Again, you know, two plus hours. It was phenomenal. And uh, we'll, we'll, awesome. Thank we'll, you. we'll fire this thing Thank back you. up and do this again. Um, thanks for listening out there, everybody. Make sure you go and hit all the likes and subscribe buttons. Uh, hit, go over and definitely subscribe to the channel on YouTube. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, check us out at noshitcast.com. Links to uh, all the places you can see podcast media. They're located on the page. And we'll catch you all next time. Bye, Fickles. So there we go, boys and girls. Awesome. <laughs>